Good evening, everybody. Tonight is Wednesday, 13th. My name is John Arena. This is the second in our board's review of town budgets. Tonight, after hopefully brief liaison reports and any public comment, we'll continue our discussions on the public library, public safety, fire and emergency services, police, and our CASA. I have a couple of opening comments. Uh, some of you may wonder why tonight's meeting is occurring and why at this point in the calendar. In part because of a desire to respond to comments and in part because we want to develop a much higher level of awareness. The board has asked <coughs> that these meetings be conducted with, step, with uh, heads within the town to present their particulars. The desired outcome is clarity. We hear often in our conversations the term transparency. I believe what we're trying to establish is something slightly different. A clear view of how the budgets are put together and how the organizations that those budgets support um, dovetail into the organization. Transparency is giving you the phone book. Clarity is giving you the street address with everyone on that, on that road to be able to navigate effectively. Another footnote before we begin is that sitting in tonight as well is our finance committee, um, both as an observer and as a commenter as to what's presented. Um, with that, I'll ask for liaison reports. I can't imagine there are any. Andrew? None. Dan? None. Barry? Nothing. Clear. Okay. Bob, any opening comments? Nothing. All set. <laughs> okay. With that, we'll get right into the topic of the public library. All right. Amy? Um, can you hear me? Let me know. Um, call the finance committee to order. Yes. Cool. Then comes call to order. Thank you, Peter. So, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity. As as, as always, it's. Um, you may need to pull that mic really close. It's rather quiet. That's for the house. Okay. How about I turn it on? Yeah, that would, that would help. <laughs> there, uh, there, better, that yeah. better? <laughs> Okay. So, thank you, as always, for the opportunity to present um, some information about the library. Um, and I will try for clarity as much as I can. Um, we were given the directive to kind of go over our, our staffing as it is. It is always. Uh, as always a big part of our um, budget. Uh, the Board of Trustees and Elected Board oversees the library and they um, director, I direct, I report directly to the Board of Trustees. Uh, we have an administrative department that also includes an assistant director and our senior administrative assistant. Uh, we have a children's department, reference services. Those are mostly um, deal with the front of the house, we call it, the collections, the development and programming. Um, those two departments address needs of ages 0 to 5, which we call early literacy, our school age population, teens, adults, and elder services. Then we come to the back of the house, which is really primarily circulation, and our technical services. They deal a lot more with patron accounts, meeting rooms, museum passes, acquisitions and cataloging, processing, and interlibrary loan. Um, the FTE discussion, um, which is always an interesting one, uh, we have, right at this moment, we have 20.8 full-time equivalents. That's made up of 29 regular employees and um, some seasonal pages. See, our pages make up about 1.1 to 1.3 FTEs, and they are seasonal because they're often high schoolers. They come in, sometimes they don't work for a few months, or they work, you know. So that number does fluctuate based on those particular seasonal positions. Um, in addition to our regular employees, we have nine substitutes, and those are just per diem, and they are used to fill in for illness, vacation, etc. I also wanted to point out that we have an average of 20 hours a week of volunteer work that's over a half FTE. Um, so we do get support from the community, and we could not do a lot of the services that we implement. We could not do that without our volunteers. Um, uh, there was also a question about how the fiscal year 19 budget presentation affects the FTE. It is a little different because Sundays aren't actually part of the standard work week. It's an extra hour, but if you had to guesstimate it based on the staffing and the hours, um, the ask is essentially a .75 FTE, um, although it's all fulfilled from within the existing staff. Um, I would like to just take a moment to remind you of the uh, library mission and also our 
requirements. Uh, the library provides professional services, trusted resources, cultural and educational program, <coughs> programs, and a welcoming community space for personal growth, collaboration, and respectful discourse. That is our mission. Um, we are required by law to um, have a standard municipal appropriation requirement. This is a three-year average. And I just bring this up at this point because last year our increase was 1.25%. And that's just a point of information so that if you were to have 1.25% for three consecutive years, you would not be meeting the standard. It needs to be an average of 2.5% over a three-year average. So. Um, we do have a state mandate, unfended Fair mandate way. there. Uh, due to the size of our community, we are required to be open about 60 hours a week. And uh, the state requires that we have a materials budget allocation, and this could be for physical or digital services, of 13%. I just make a note here that the trustees um, have a recommendation that this be kept at 14%. The materials allocation requirement is based on population size. The sizes are basically 15,000 to 24,999. We're now just over 25. This population group that we're in goes all the way up to 49,999. So um, it is sort of a judgment call that we're on the smaller side of the larger communities. So 14% uh, allocation of materials um, is something that the trustees and I try to work, work towards each year. So with the budget summary, um, the current fiscal year 19 ask is an increase of 6.6%. Um, the goal is to restore Sundays that we dropped last year and also to continue the growth of our digital services and our programs. Um, both of these come through our strategic plan which runs from fiscal year 16 to fiscal year 21 and it's on file with the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. Um, our goal, other than that, is to maintain uh, service levels in all other area. We're not trying to grow any other part of our of our um, of our work. Um, the 6.6 percent increase in wages is um, mostly due to the 44,500 um, dollars that we would need to run Sundays from September through May from 1 to 5 p.m. This is four hours. And it's basically um, calculated at Labor Day through Memorial Day. So it's four hours of service on Sundays, and um, it's for a very specific time. It doesn't include summers. The six point, if you take away that, 40, that $44,000, the uh, increase in salaries would come right back down to about 3%. So that, that's what the increase at 6.6% is. The increase in expenses is uh, due mostly to directives from our strategic plan. Um, professional development and travel, professional <coughs> development travel. Um, it's really important that we be able to continue to um, to learn our librarians, our teachers, and their instruction instructors. So we do need to stay on top of um, <coughs> what the trends are in learning. Our fiscal year 19 action plan, which we've already um, filed with the state, actually includes. Um, programs and initiatives that have to deal with short reading, micro learning, and flipped learning initiatives. So in order to implement those and use them, we need to know, understand how to do it. So our staff needs to do continuing learning. Um, the other large bump you'll see there is for library uh, um, supplies and equipment. It's a 10% bump. It's really just keeping up with uh, things like the RFID tags and things like that that we need to continue to purchase to maintain our collection. Our collection isn't growing. Our physical collection doesn't grow that much, but the materials that we need to maintain it um, <coughs> do go up in cost. Um, and that would probably normalize after the first year. Uh, there's a bump in our office supplies, which looks like a whole bunch at 33%. Um, but I will say this is actually a restoration. Prior to our move to the temporary space at 80 General Way, our, our supply budget was uh, $7,000. When we moved to 80 General Way, we cut that to $3,000 for a variety of reasons. I don't know that we need to restore it to $7,000, but we do need to restore it a little bit. Um, I think we've done a lot working with the town. Uh, we. Uh, done with the copiers and our leases and a lot of the other things we have been able to centralize a lot of that but there's just still stuff that we need in the library so that's pretty much just office supplies uh, the materials budget goes up according to the salaries and the other expenses so that's just required and the final thing I just want to mention is um, 
there's something on the munis on the uh, munis report that says library transportation and it's not transportation um, I needed a placeholder for something called library programs library programs are not currently funded and I'll talk about that in a little bit but our programming is a big piece of what we do and that's currently all funded through gifts and donations there's that's not funded at all through municipal, municipal tax base so that's something that we need to really work towards so it's a placeholder it's a new line I didn't have programming line to put it in so I just grabbed an empty line and threw five thousand dollars in there but I'll talk about that a little bit more so that's the six point six percent increase ask which leads to why do you need that um, looking at our trends it's really wonderful um, last time this year a little while about January I was able to tell you sort of on a quarterly basis how are we doing we'd only opened on October we now have a full year of data to go by so I'm able to compare um, fiscal multiple fiscal years and you'll see in some places I've done fiscal year 2009 fiscal year 13 and fiscal year 17 as a comparison but a brief look at just sort of pre 80 general way to, to being open we are seeing really significant increases and with the exception of circulation all of those increases are in double digits we have the same exact staff and we have a bigger building so I just want you to keep that in mind and that is that is all 17 year to date against what that's period? all fiscal year 17 against fiscal year 13 great thank you so 13 was at the last year it was we the last full year in the building opened up uh, on the old okay. yeah Four. yeah because there were there were weird cutoff dates because we right. moved and closed in the middle of fiscal years um, the, just so you know and you will see these numbers from fiscal year 9 as well uh, fiscal year 9 um, was and these are these are great numbers at least broadly to look at because if you think about the way the economy has been working in fiscal year 9 there were significant that was actually started to be actually an increase in library usage because the economy was not as strong so there was a lot more use in services um, we continued to see growth and so you'll see mostly growth in fiscal year 13 and where some libraries may possibly be seeing a leveling off of service we're, we're in general seeing uh, larger increases um, one of the things I just really wanted to point out that um, although our growth in circulation and I by no means consider circulation to be the end-all be-all of, of, of our business it's, I think like other businesses we our device diversified it's not just circulation of materials it's not just the books and movies we have other things that we do but our circulation has gone up three percent over um, fiscal year 13 numbers but even more impressive than that I just wanted to point out that of the 66 public libraries in the state we are actually 28th in terms of circulation so this includes the big guys like Boston Public Library and larger you know city libraries and things like that so for a community our size to be coming in 28 that's actually <coughs> quite good um, is there a story Amy and what leads the three percent in terms of those categories or is it kind yeah, of yeah um, a little bit um, that I can um, tell you right now that what gets checked out um, we see an increase actually in our print services so for those of you who feel that ebooks are taking over the world and that libraries are no longer being used um, I might have evidence to the contrary um, there is still a big print very very heavy use in our print we see a big drop in DVDs and music CDs and that's really to be expected it's one of the reasons we have a service which I'll show you in a minute which is about downloadable music and we're looking into streaming services um, just kind of like when we phased out VHS tapes and audio cassette tapes and we phased in the next medium we do the same thing mm. here um, so 71% of our circulation is print um, that's children's teens and adults 6% audio 16% video overdrive refers to our audio our ebooks so um, I, that's just the term to use it's the platform we use and then we also have um, actually a surprising number of other things that we circulate <coughs> that are very popular everything from telescopes to the Roomba Roomba <laughs> that will clean your house for you um, and projectors and laminators and ukuleles and um, gadgets and gadgets and GoPros and things like that and, and that's a pretty popular collection hey, you got, just, uh, that's quickly so um, in terms of circulation we're pretty 
we're a busy library. We're a busy library, Relative yeah. to other places in the state. Um, do you compare any of your budget numbers, or the trustees compare any of your budget numbers in terms of, you know, dollars per capita, things like that, yes. against the peer communities like we do on yep. other things? I've never seen that presented. Yep. I don't know if that's behind there somewhere. I don't have that in the but slide, but I do have those I'd numbers. be curious to see, uh, again, you know, what are we accomplishing with how much we're spending? Mm -hmm. Reading traditionally accomplishes more by spending less. I'm assuming the library fits in that pattern, well, especially if we're 28. And so I, I don't know yeah. what we're... I, I will tell you that some of the libraries that are ahead of us are <coughs> Wellesley and Concord and Lexington and libraries that actually put quite a bit of money into their libraries and they have endowments and things like that. So in terms of per capita, um, I can't tell you exactly what it is, but we're not... Um, either terribly high or terribly low. Okay. But so we're terribly busy. We're terribly busy, okay. yes. But that doesn't mean everybody is very terribly happy <laughs> being that terribly busy. Yeah. Um, just as a side note. Um, but it also translates just for another perspective. That's 133 items that we're touching every single hour. So. Um, but I don't think circulation is the only way you can ever measure what we do. Uh, one of the things you don't see in circulation are our digital services. These are services that are mostly available from the comfort of your own home. Uh, the state does provide a certain number of databases, but we, the Reading Public Library, provide for the residents um, a whole bunch of subscriptions and licensed content from a number of digital service vendors. <coughs> the newest thing we've added in the last year is full text, full access to the New York Times. You can go to the New York Times through our portal put in your library card number and it's just like you're on New York Times and you can do that from home. We also have access, the same thing, a type of access to the Wall Street Journal, although that is limited to being in the building. So if you're in the building, you can just sit and read the Wall Street Journal online. Um, our usage in fiscal year 17 was 90,000, over 90,000 electronic uses. They're a little harder to track because when you go to look the New York Times, you might look at five or six articles, it's one person, it's harder to tell in terms of circulation, you don't have to return that. Um, you look at it, maybe you don't like it. Um, it's a little harder to measure, but that's a lot of usage. Um, we have over 40 digital magazines, and one of the highest use is Consumer Reports. You can figure out which washing machine you want to buy, and from the comfort of your own home. We do have a music service, which um, allows you to do download and keep, not just stream, but download and keep. Um, any of seven million dollar seven million downloadable music tracks and we're currently looking into video <coughs> streaming so that would slowly move to, to replace our physical so that's from TV home doing collection. the download that's the goal yes that's the goal there are a few products that try to limit it in-house but we t in general we tend not to go with those licensing models because they're a little more restrictive um, but um, Having said that, um, we also do lend out Roku's, and every uh, DVD and Blu-ray that we buy comes with a digital version of the movie, and we download those to the Roku. So if you check out our Roku, you also come with a movie library. Just a pitch there. So you have Sony up there. So do you have the whole catalog. Yeah, it's something through something called Freegal, and they and they contract with Sony. It's just they don't have a lot of independence and some other labels, but um, they have some pretty good music. So. Um, we also added something called My Heritage this year, which works um, very similar to Ancestry.com. We have a lot of interest in local history and genealogy. Those are very popular, as well as learning databases like Tutor.com, which allows you to do a one-to-one -to -one tour, <coughs> and Learning Express, which uh, is really great for test preparation and things like that. And that's only one half of the digital services that we provide. Um, we do have 30 public use computers. Um, we have an annualized usage. I say annualized because it's something we check periodically and then just sort of calculate it out. But the average use of over 11,000 uses of these 30 computers, as well as over 70,000 Wi-Fi sessions. So people come here to um, check their email, to use the printer, to apply for a job. Um, not everybody has broadband at home, so sometimes that's exactly what they're coming here for. Um, and obviously, if you run out of ink and your paper is due tomorrow, we're a great place to go to get your report printed out. Um, but having said that, um, all of this activity leads to more questions. There's a significant increase in the number of reference interactions that we have. It's tough for me to call those reference interactions because the questions that we get are so varied. Um, the questions we get are now more complicated. It's not just do you have this book? 
it's do you have this book can I get it electronically can I put it on my Google Pixel phone or my iPad I don't know how to which app there's three apps I can use which one should I use um, my granddaughter just gave me this iPad and I'm really not sure how to download things onto it so the interactions that we have with um, patrons of all ages are quite a bit more extensive um, can you help me attach my resume to this online job application um, we get questions like that but more importantly um, I think that one of the reasons we see an increase in these reference interactions is because um, right now and current August 30th 2017 your research report indicates that people trust the library and um, surprisingly most Americans and especially Millennials feel that libraries help them find reliable and trustworthy information and so there's a really big gap between like you were saying having the phone book and then finding what you need to who's on the street that right. you're looking for so um, 78 percent or one in eight adults feel that public libraries um, not only help them find reliable information but also help them learn things so um, I think that's part of the reason why we're seeing such a big jump people are overwhelmed and they're unsure where to go to and they come to us so I think it's wonderful but we do take questions in person on phone we take text and chat questions um, we average about 24 questions per hour and then you add that on top of 133 items that we have to touch per hour we're getting to some very very busy service desks Amy the change from 13 to 17 is 20 percent is it reasonable to, to to say that some that some of that increase or all that increase is the sort you just described you know more the de the device rather than the meat than the subject matter itself um is that a way to think of it or no you should just think of it as a toss salad I'm not trying sure I'm not trying sure to understand what you're asking there's 20 percent more in 17 sure. than 13. Yes. One, one way to read that is in 17 there's so many more of these things floating around right right, more right. Of so people are just are more overwhelmed and they need correct more clarification. Is, is that the is that one driver um, I think that's one driver I think the other driver is simply we're busy building we're busier and bigger than we were so you'll you know our, we'll talk about the number of visitors that we have we have more people in the building just asking us questions yeah. but we have a higher profile I guess so um, I do I do think that there is a lot of confusion and um, frustration and um, on the part of people seeking information and, and wanting to learn so and I think that's why they, they come here because it's a resource thank you um, which brings us to visitors um, we're up visitors by 24 um, percent we're almost we were almost at about a half a um, quarter of a million walk-ins uh, last year um, we have a lot of people coming into the library um, we're open 60 hours a week 52 uh, roughly 52 weeks a year it's a couple of holidays that we are closed um, but this is a big increase in our foot traffic so the sheer management of the building and just you know the situational awareness that we need to be aware of what's going on that's a really huge that's taken a huge toll on our staff um, we're seeing larger groups of kids so we have uh, kids and adults but I was just going to mention there are two things that we do we bring in um, every single sixth grader from the district for a tour of the library so there's over 300 kids coming into the building over a, a couple week period for that um, we started doing exam crams last year we had over 370 kids at our two nights over two night period uh, where the library had extended hours for studying only um, <coughs> You know that that is not something where you can just open up the library doors and kind of have a, a staff member hanging out those are but they're very very valuable and we've had a lot of great feedback from both of those types of programs um, we also increased the service desk so what that means is we have um, where we normally had a children's desk two desks on the main floor we now have a uh, desk on the ground floor um, that requires staffing that is both a safety issue but also just there's enough people in the building that they're, they're, they're answering regularly answering questions so that's 85 visitors per hour and we get which I still boggles my mind I'm trying to figure it out and understand it but we have uh, over a hundred new member registrations every month on average so sometimes that's 90 and sometimes that's 115 or 120 new library cards issued every month so there's people moving out new people somebody gets it for their kid to me that's an amazing number to think that 100 people are walking in here every month and asking to join 
the library. Actually, that, that, the question I have, obviously there's a huge spike, um, the, you know, the first year that you're open. Do, do you track it on a monthly basis? Yes. And, and so the question that I have is, um, how much of that 24% increase would you attribute to the novelty factor? Oh, wow, there's a new library, mm -hmm. let me check it out. And how much of it is, oh my God, I heard the new library is great and more and more people are actually good. So are you seeing the trend month by month going <laughs> yes. up? So, cause that's I, I do do the trend month by month, if you want to know a little secret, out on public television, um, <laughs> our actual people tracker wasn't really working till quite far into the... <laughs> <laughs> into this into the opening so I actually can't accurately tell you how many people came in in October November December and January the first four months we were open which I believe were busier than any other months we have so this is that the slower periods this is the February's and the March and this is I, I say slower but then we get into summer and we're often slammed during the summertime believe it or not it's actually a busier time for us so I'm I don't I don't think that I think it's a little bit of that but the numbers aren't really that far off from right. from our previous. I think it makes sense that these numbers are probably going to continue on trend, particularly particularly if we're able to maintain our services. Okay. So, if we if we're dropping services, dropping programs, dropping hours, <coughs> then no, those those numbers won't stay there. But what's not getting tracked in quote unquote visitors are the folks that would read the New York Times from their living room with their library. Card. Correct. So they're not coming into the library. <coughs> Correct. But that's all that's just but the they're flip utilizing track. libraries. So Correct. you know, if, if there's a way to kind of count those in the tally. Um, that's the ninety thousand that electronic uses, but you're right, those are uses that could be you it could be better. Right, I could come here to read the paper. Could, you could be checking the paper every day. So right. I yes, but versus right. like another person. So but yeah, we do try to capture that, but it is it's a little bit like putting the fruit in the carts. They're all a little bit different. So another quick um, follow up along the same lines. Um, some of these are non-Reading residents, I assume. Absolutely. It'd be interesting cut to see the split between Reading and non-Reading or adjacent towns. Um, on an individual, just visitor basis, we can't tell that, but we do report to the state all of our circulations that are go that that go. Um, right. We track what items. <coughs> this is why this, you know circulation is such a big thing because it's easy to track. We track how many items we actually physically send to other libraries throughout the state and actually the United States Central Library alone as well as the number that we take in from other libraries. We also specifically track, if you walk into our library with a non-Reading library card, we have the number of, and we report that to the state, and, and it's a number that they use to help calculate our state aid, the number of non-Reading residents that we're, and, and out-of-state out of state residents, we get folks from New Hampshire, um, that we provide services to in our building. So the computers, track we uh, are able to right. get those numbers but I think, just not this i think so the 109 a, a month can you d is it possible that those are almost all reading oh. occasionally we'll get someone from okay. wakefield but and okay but you know or, or, or nearby okay. um but all we need if you are not from here if you're you know from hyannis and you have a valid <coughs> library card in hyannis we don't issue you a card we have reciprocal privileges so we just enter your card into our system I that's see. not a, that's not a new reading card that's just a that's just an on the fly record. So 109 is true foot traffic, no prior library card, yeah. library experience. Or well, could be somebody who lost their library card I and see. forgot I it see. and has never used it or something like that. I but see. yes, I'll, sometimes they're returning kids from college who, you know, that kind of thing. But do they actually carry a card, or is it on is an app on the iPhone? You can use your, you can, we have that avail availability, but yes, absolutely, we have key cards and full size cards available for, for, for your use. And, and lastly, regards to the people tracker and <coughs> the uptick in foot traffic, will, will any of your remarks speak to kind of situational awareness of the building itself and where people are <coughs> and, you know, just awareness of what's going on inside from a street? Which I, I, Yes, I was going to touch about that a little bit on the end. And All right, we'll that's see great. I'll wait. Today. Thank you. Just very briefly, though. Amy, could I ask you a, a quick question? Sure. First, you, I, I thought you were not going to call out uh, people who lost their library card. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very um, sorry about that. <clears throat> but you mentioned that uh, summertime is a very busy time. You guys get really slammed in the summertime. Um, so why do you have reduced hours in the summertime we actually don't have reduced hours in the summertime we're open saturdays on the, yes we've been okay. open saturdays for quite a while so we are open 60 hours a week for the entire time the only hours that we lost which were just this past year were sundays Sunday. from okay. may uh, october to may so all right um, that's, that's yeah. 
and that's the reason is because we're so busy in the summer so. um, meeting rooms the space is afforded us the wonderful opportunity to become more of a community center um, we previously only had two meeting rooms now we have um, more than that some of them reserved only for library use but many of them open to the public <coughs> Um, so we've seen an incredible increase in the use of meeting rooms just because we have more. But more importantly than that, um, we have almost 400 um, community meetings here in the library in fiscal year 17. And that is an 11 month year because we didn't have any meetings here in September of 2016. Um, this more <coughs> More meetings rooms require, talk about situational awareness. Um, more meeting rooms um, is wonderful. And we have had um, sports registrations and referee coaching kind of seminars. We've had um, office hours. We've had Seth Moulton here. We have uh, we've had a piano recital here. Uh, the Department of Justice hosted a, a risk assessment um, workshop for clinicians here. So we are working with um, state government, local government. We have we had Alice training here for all town employees. We're we're really it's great, um, and it's exhausting. It talk about such well. It's not just a problem for us. We do have technology, and we do books book do room bookings, and there's wonderful. Um, uh, programs that we use and our staff has taken all of this on it's it is a drain on our custodial services which actually is paid for out of facilities but I will say that you know for example this room had to be broken down entirely for two meetings that went on earlier today and then it had to be reset up um, so you know all the microphones and everything have to be put away um, just the sheer management of it in terms of making sure um, that the folks who are using the rooms meet the library policies um, there's there's all, all meeting room rentals are mediated so someone has to physically look at it and make sure it meets all the criteria so it is a big drain it's a wonderful drain to have but it's um, it is a lot of work and I think it's something that um, we did not necessarily take into account um, we are very careful that when the rooms are not in use that they are locked um, all the program rooms including the children's program room upstairs um, are, don't have good line of sight in them so um, if you're sitting with the service desk down there, you can't necessarily see what's going on in, in here. You can see the hallway, but not in here. So, um, so it is, it is a, a great and wonderful uh, resource to have, and um, it's just been really, really busy. Where do you think that line goes to in the coming years? That's a, that's a hard question to a answer, I know, but if you thought about your total capacity and your total use model today, and you just did a quick back of the envelope do you think it doubles I think it, I think I think it could easily increase by a third I don't think it would double okay but I think um, the problem is is that um, excellent segue Mr. Arena um, <laughs> the problem is is that we also had over 600 programs or 600 programs library programs um, last year so the library itself uses these I see it's a fraction quite a bit right um, so um, and it's an excellent segue, and I forgot to mention something in the last slide, but I'll try and come back to that. But um, Reading is learning. Um, what do I mean by that? That we had almost 18,000 people come to some sort of learning or cultural event at the library last year. That's about 70% of our population. I know it's not 70% of the actual people, but when you count it out, people in Reading want to learn. Um, the world is learning. 74% of all adults consider themselves to be lifelong learning, and that lifelong learners, and that's both personal learners, so people who are just interested in hobbies and it's you know reading and gardening and all those other things. And but also 63% of adult workers consider consider their themselves lifelong learners, and learning as a requirement to either stay certified or eligible or relevant to their job. So um, we had 600 programs. We had almost 18,000 people in the building. Um, those are significant numbers. It's 14%, both in the number of programs that we offered as well as the number of people that were attending them. That, that when you were going to ask me how many more programs could we offer, that is at flat capacity. That's actually over capacity. I mean, I, I am 
blown away by the fact that we got to offer 600 programs last year because of the staff that we have. That's a lot of time. We do hire out for instructors and, and you know, program providers and musicians and things like that. But a large number of those programs are run, are, are, are planned and run by our staff. So it's, it's a pretty it's a pretty big drain. And Amy, remind us again, obviously they're all different sizes and capacities, but what are the total number of meeting areas? Um, I think it depends whether you count this room as one or two. Got it. We split it out. So there's uh, three on this floor if you count this as two. Um, we do use the we consider the teen space and the studio on the main floor to be made. We use those for programs, right. so it's, those are internal use only. Although sometimes, <coughs> sometimes we let people use them. And then there's the children's room on the second floor and the local history room. So seven. on that's about seven. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so uh, to the original ask for five thousand dollars for programming. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the funding for all of our programs and classes are, is external. We rely on the Friends of the Reading Public Library, the Foundation, and other gifts and donations. We also apply for grants and things like that. Um, our strategic plan, which was based, uh, which we did in, in 2015, I guess, 2015 for fiscal year 16 through 21, um, included a study and um, there was a clear clear directive for more programs for more learning opportunities um, it's very difficult to for us to to reach this both through staffing but also just through the sheer funding of this um, i will tell you that five thousand dollars could easily be a drop in the bucket um, it's about um, i think last year we spent about $38,000 in program, $40,000 probably is a better estimate. Um, we do try to get grants. We've had grants ranging anywhere from $5,000 to $20,000 for programming. Those are wonderful, wonderful years. But federal grants are getting um, more scarce. So um, I think, and the trustees have talked about this actually for a couple of years, um, I really do think it's time for um, the town of Reading to at least consider the option of providing some sort of guaranteed base funding for our programs. So I just think something to consider. So I mean, when you say programs, you mean like the speaker series, a music series, exactly. a cooking class? I'm not class, talking about snacks uh, and like, you right. know, paper bowls, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I think definitely we, to get people in here who are knowledgeable at it, I mean, you know, knowledgeable, experienced, and educated, we need to hire people to do some of these things. Um, even some of the trainings that we do, some of the instruction that we do. So when you said you had 600 events, classes, um, that was funded predominantly by the Friends? Yep. And that was, you said, 40000 40, 50000 yeah. plus with the foundation? And That's 40000 total, I think. Total. It's, it's really... So, the fi so let's just say it's 5000 yeah. Like what? Like, what would that extra, like, get? That would higher get program, quality, that would get, higher yes. quantity? Yes. Like it would get, I think it would... <coughs> I defer to the trustees and going back to your strategic plan. <laughs> um, however, I, I think that there is an opportunity to, um, quality is a tricky word, but to bring in more outside uh, expertise, um, which would relieve some of the staffing requirements to learn how to do 3D printing on the fly and then present something on that. Um, so, because somebody, they wanted to do that. So we already do rely uh, uh, um, on outside expertise. We try to bargain ourselves down to the lowest bidder, um, but that's not always what we want to do and what we feel is the uh, most responsible way to present the information to the public. Um, and one of the things we do try is make sure that we're, we're providing if we're providing um, point of view A, we do try very hard to make sure that we're providing, providing an equal and opposite point of view, or at least a panel of well-balanced um, kind of information. So now you're like, can we have two speakers? And right. <laughs> so it does get up there. So you know, funding is always going to be a limitation. Um, so if you wanted to bring in like an author, to yeah, we do bring in authors. Is that is that subsidized through the friends as well, yeah. or is that uh, authors? Or, they don't come groups. for free. Yeah. They never come for free. <laughs> So, um, if they do, then it's probably something else that they want us to do. So, but it is a really, really big part of what we do. 
So. Um, and, and that forty thousand dollar number, that's the total external. I would support? say it averages on every year between thirty eight, you know, like thirty five and forty five thousand dollars. It just depends on what kind of year we have. So. And that's the total pool from external support sources. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um. I'm almost done. Goose and fire. I really am. Um, so, um, just a very the simple ROA calculation. It's really hard to measure the value of libraries. There's a lot of social and emotional and developmental things that go on here. Um, but if you look at the fiscal year 13, that was our uh, fiscal year 17. I'm sorry, that was our budget, 1.4 million. You take that and you use a very rough, rough calculator. It's by no means scientific, but it is a ballpark. Um, if you just look simply at the number of adult print books that we circulated and you average that the hardcover cost is $17, you know, you can get it for less, sometimes you pay more. Um, you're talking about 100% <coughs> return on your investment. Um, even though some of the people in this room may not ever check out a book or rent a room here or attend a program or ask a question, the residents of Reading are getting over six million dollars worth of, of service from the library, which I think is a pretty darn good deal. This is a very interesting way to do it. I've never seen it. Yeah. You're looking at the opportunity cost of just having to buy the asset right. as opposed to have it on a shared basis. That's really clever. Yes. Yeah, but you're not counting the value. I'm not yeah, counting the electricity. Yeah. And no, but not even that. This the, what's the value of people coming together and learning and Yes, that's and, the social, and emotional, and, 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 and that, you know, that that's priceless. Community. So yeah, the community yeah, value, I think, is is I can't I can't put a price on it. I never would dream to do that. I presume to do that, but um, just I know that numbers can kind of again these are fallible numbers. They're arguable, um, but not everyone can have Amazon Prime or or, or whatever. And, and um, I think one of the things that I have been struck with, both being at Eddie General Way, just on a personal note. One of the things I've been struck by is that experience at 80 General Way and here um, where we're seeing a much more diverse um, um, population come into the library in any time kind of diversity, whether you want to call it socioeconomic or by color or by age, um, that not everybody can afford to go and get their Amazon Prime. Um, one interesting fact um, about learning is that um, again to the whole why libraries you can get everything you need online from Google um, lifelong learning among educated um, initially well-off individuals is very technology driven learning for people who don't fall in either of those categories, so people who are economically challenged or perhaps start off the bat being a little less educated, is very place-based learning. They go to libraries. They need a place to learn. So I think if we're going to address the needs of the full community and recognize that our community is diverse um, and we embrace the diversity that we have, that we need to make sure that we're meeting the needs of everybody um, as much as we can. So. Um, that's why I'm asking for a 6.6 .6 budget increase. Um, Bob also asked us to talk a little bit about future plans. Um, I said I was going to talk a little bit about situational awareness. It was kind of a fudge. I wasn't really, but basically, we're flat out. We're flat out managing this building. Um, our strategic plan, which we wrote before we even had this building, acknowledged that having this new building was going to put a stress on our staff, even with our new automated systems and our new technology. Um, it was a very um, deftly written strategic plan, and they and it basically said, as appropriate or as dictated by patrons, they recommended an increase, or it recommended recommends an increase of one to two point five full time equivalent staff members. They anticipated this need. Um, looking at the fiscal year seventeen numbers and currently what I'm seeing in fiscal year eighteen, um, I do think that. The technology that we have and some of the other new workflows that we have, we're updating all of our job descriptions and relooking a lot of that. I think we can absorb about a 0.5 FTE, about 20 hours. I think we can readjust things so that we can better use 20 hours of our staff time. But um, we are in desperate need, I think, of at least another 0.75 person, um, half a person at a paraprofessional and 
at least a, a quarter, so that's about 18 to 20 hours, <coughs> and at least another 8 to 10 hours of a professional <coughs> educator, or someone with a, someone with a, a library degree or maybe even education degree um, to help us with instruction and programming. Um, we, we do need that, and part of that is um, not necessarily the situation awareness part, but just the fact that we're just so overwhelmed by the size of this building. Um, security is is good. I mean, you know, it's, it's a great library, and the design does have a lot of great like, signs, uh, line of sight. Um, but um, it is we do we do a lot more um, walking around and checking in on people and things like that. So it is it is a, it, it does take a toll. So. Do you have any questions about our current or future needs? Well, I mean, you're doing, you're basically, was it 25, 30% more space square footage wise? Or maybe? It was, we were 32, now we're at 39 and change. So, so yeah, about 25%. Yeah, so basically you're, you're staffing Staying the, same. the same, and you know, there's more desks, there's more walking around, mm -hmm. um, there's more visitors. So I'm actually a little surprised um, that you know the, the, the two-year trend was really to only ask for maybe one more. Per, I mean, go back, go out five years. And well, if I go out five if years, you go out five yeah. years, <laughs> and, 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 and assuming that the trends continue, continue in terms of yeah. the usage, then it would be. It, it might be. I, I I I would hesitate to ask for you know two and a half people right away. I think that that might be pre right. premature. <coughs> Again, technology and, and jobs change. Um, but in skill sets change, so um, I was trying to be prudent well, no, I, <laughs> and sensitive. Yeah. Well, the thing is, we spent $18 million on a new building. Yeah. Let's get the most out of it, especially since it's the building that everybody comes to, yeah. that nobody wanted to pay for, apparently. Yeah. But, um, yeah. you know, it is, I will say this, it, it is being used. It's, right. it's so I, I think used. that, it, 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 and, and, and you'll figure this out as, as you know, as it grows, yeah. what you're going to need. But I think it's it's not it's not uh, a far reach to say that um, we might need to be investing more in terms of personnel and things as this, you know, as you know, as the library really comes into its own and um, as those numbers grow. So uh, I mean, that's just maybe not for this year's discussion, but you know, certainly I over guess time. It just uh, parting comment to that so that we can actually get to the. Bigger, bigger budgets, um, and I, I really, really appreciate you saying that, Barry. I think I think you're exactly right. Um, but I also know, and um, I only work here, but I am a resident as well. Yeah. That there are other gaps in staffing in other areas that are equally as important, and um, it needs to be considered holistically. And um, so. I appreciate your words. I've presented you with what I think is is fair, is a fair and honest and very clear ask um, or express need, I'll say. Um, but I do appreciate that the, 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 the voters, the town taxpayers, and the board of selectmen and the finance committee understand that this is this is the town as a whole, and it's not about my department and my other department. So thank you. One last question, Amy. Yes. Uh, any, do you see any on the horizon any one-time spend or any um, technology spend? It may be hard to talk about it today, but either security, you talked about a people count or anything along those lines. No, I would not do that <laughs> after $18 million. Um, I don't. I don't see that. I think actually we are very well placed short of something that's just an unforeseen something that's supposed to work for a while it just breaks down. Um, there are small <coughs> facility issues that we come into contact with. The facility is wonderful about working with us. We, we, the trustees are all involved with decisions, you know. But the technology that's in here is, is current and should last us for a while. Do I think in 10 years we're going to need an upgrade of all of our wireless access points? That's entirely possible, but I can't, I actually can't really predict that right now. It wasn't a trick question. It was just yeah. sometimes you get in and you find oops. Yeah, the no, right. I think um, I think it was it was pretty well budgeted okay. um, in terms of what the needs are. There are a few sort of wish list items, but they're not okay. really on a grand scale. Good. I think we've managed to take care of most of the the gaps Good. already. Thank you. Any questions from FinCom? Mark. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, the request the six point six percent increase on the salary. Line. Yep. So it's mostly Sunday. It's months. all Sunday. Oh, and then what's this? That's, that's the, what I didn't ask for. That's 
Um, we didn't ask for that because we really just wanted to get back to where we started. Um, that strategic plan was written while we still had Sundays, so we're we're behind the ball now with providing those services that were, that included the hours that we, and services we provided on Sunday. So we were just looking for this year to get back onto the to, to bring it back to normalize it. Okay. So, so this is not part of the system. No. Yeah. It would probably bring that up closer to eight. I think. I think. I think I looked at it one time. I think it's like closer to eight percent or nine percent. Paul, I was thinking this was in the Delta. So that that's not the six point six percent. No, that is not in there. That's something that. What was that question? Could you repeat the question? The question was um, that the just reiterating that this. Um, these two numbers, the 22 and 13.5, are not included in that ask. Right, um, right. The okay. current ask for fiscal year 19. And just for um, understanding your staff, because staff have virtually all the hours the same staff, or is it oh, a bigger staff during certain hours? Be careful. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have to be careful while I answer that question mm -hmm. um, for safety and security reasons. Um, but um, we are we do Let's use. Metrics based on the busyness of our library. So um, we're particularly busy between, um, say, probably about three and five or three and six in the afternoon. Schools have gotten out. Nobody's really required to go home for dinner yet. Um, we do often have extra staff during those times. Um, and when we know that we're going to be, sh you know, when it's going to be quiet, we know that it's, you know, if somebody that's sick, it's okay. So we do try to balance the the busy and um, not busy times and we do use both that people counter that's measuring people coming in and out of the doors and our circulation as a gauge for that um, so that those are those are two metrics we use um, it's not terribly it doesn't change terribly much but you know Saturdays are busy uh, Mondays are not so we have that so. yeah Dan did you have a Amy, question? Amy um, Andy? First of all, thank you for a very data-driven pre presentation. Um, that's helpful. Um, I just have, I have to make the comment, I think I've made it to you before, I think it's an important to put this in pre all in perspective um, as far as how much money we spend on operating the library in town uh, equals about how much we spend to remove the trash from, from the town. So, so yeah. people should be aware. I'm not comparing you. No, to I know, I know. You're talking I'm about context. Saying, You're talking context about context and, and right. perspective. So, six per six point six percent is is a large percentage, but in, in context, it's a small number. Yes, yeah. it is a small number. So. And Dan, Dan, I feel like you just keep placing your finger. I wanted to commend your first bullet, and that's the first time I've seen that bullet from any budget presentation by any group. And I would hold that up as an example of something we like to see. Is a board that has to make tough decisions about what to fund, either below the line, above the line, going back to the voters. That really helps us uh, <coughs> sell the fact that you're, you're trying hard to save effort here. Yeah. So, thank you okay. for that. Yeah. Very good presentation, Amy. Nice thank and crisp. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you. <laughs> Why don't we take a minute here while we reorganize the room? Amy? Two minute break, right? Amy? Yes. yes sir.
it off. Okay, that's probably a good thing because. <laughs> Good evening. Oh, much better. That's better. I'm uh, Greg Burns, Fire Chief, and also the Emergency, Med Emergency Management Director for the Town of Reading. Uh, for tonight's budget, I, I thought I would give a little bit of an overview of the fire department and uh, give some information on uh, trending data on responses and um, also some information that we. Um, found through uh, an internal study that we did and also an old study that was done um, back in 1987. So the, the Reading Fire Department has four major responsibilities, fire suppression, fire prevention, the emergency medical system, system and also emergency management. Uh, for our, our salary budget, uh, the total FY19 salary budget request is for uh, just over $5 million. And it, we're requesting an increase of 10% uh, over the approved FY18 budget. And the increase is to add four additional firefighter positions. Um, and also we have to calculate in uh, raises for uh, non-union personnel according to the uh, compensation plan and also we're in negotiations with the union we had to factor um, an estimate for, for those uh, increases the expense budget uh, request uh, is is two hundred twenty four thousand five hundred dollars this is a 17 percent increase over the FY 18 budget and that's primarily uh, for a couple of things to provide uniforms and protective clothing for the four requested people and also um, a, an increase to the um, line items for EMS supplies and um, for uh, firefighter training. It was a $7,000 request for uh, ALS medical supplies and um, a $3,000 request for uh, firefighter training. That's used to pay for, um, uh, to renew paramedic EMT licenses and also to pay tuition costs for outside training for certification for every two years we have to recertify everybody. Chief, that you said 224K, is that correct? Uh, for, the, for the entire expense budget, 224,000. And that's already 17% gross stuff, or no, it's 17? That, that's, that's an increase of 17% okay, over you. FY18. And most of that, the vast majority of that is for the protective clothing and uniforms for the for the new people. It costs about thirty five hundred dollars to outfit in a new person in protective clothing from the from the, from the helmet, protective hood, a, 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 a breathing a mask for the breathing air, the turn off coat, turn off pants, uh, specialized gloves, and uh, and boots. All of that product has a lifetime as well, even during service. It does. Yes, we replace it every six years. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you don't try that. Um, in of the expense budget, fifty-four percent, one hundred twenty-two thousand, is for the EMS system, um, and that's for uh, supplies, uh, ambulance billing, uh, and EMS licensing and medical control. We have to have a physician to serve as our medical control physician. And that physician is uh, Dr. Walker from Melrose Wayfield Hospital, and he's been just um, fantastic to us. He helps us if we have an issue with something, and he also assists us with training. Our, our current uh, staffing levels, this is our organizational chart. We have 48.5 equivalent full-time employees. Of these 48.5 people, 44 are assigned to a group. Each group has 11 personnel consisting of two officers and nine firefighters. And their primary focus is on delivery of emergency services. The administrative functions of the department are done by the chief, assistant chief, and fire prevention officer, <coughs> and the department secretary. And we also have a, a half-time equivalent position to maintain the municipal fire alarm system. It's, it's, a, it's an $11,000 salary figure that we have that, um, we use to maintain the, the municipal system. So each day, uh, the on-duty shift staffs two engines, a ladder truck, and an ambulance. To ensure each piece has enough uh, personnel to run it, we have a minimum shift strength of 10 personnel. And we also 
count the fire prevention officer as part of that minimum staffing level. Chief, before you go on, yep. uh, I get a lot of questions about the role of the assistant chief. Could you yes. comment quickly on uh, his role day to day in the operation of the fire department? Why it is so crucial? Oh, absolutely. He assists in every aspect of the uh, department, from operations to make, making sure the apparatus is maintained properly, that our um, reporting data, that the office's reporting data on, on responses is done correctly. Uh, he assists with um, um, personnel issues. Um, uh, he assists with training, um, assists with the emergency management function. So he, he, he doesn't, we haven't carved out, you know, this is you and this is me. He yeah. kind of goes right across, right across the board. And, it, and I think it's really critical in an operation as ours that we don't have kind of silos where, you know, that's his and this is, this is mine. So he, he, we need to fill in for each other um, on, on everything. So, it's a position that's really worked out tremendously well for us, um, and it, it's, it's really helped us uh, manage the department better, and uh, it's, it's really worked out well, far better than I thought it would. Chief, in your remarks, could you, because many of the folks at home aren't necessarily following this every year, could you make sure to cover the minimum manning uh, requirements? And explain why we do that. Why we do it. Sure. What the surplus, not the surplus, what the amount of reserve is in there that you can deal with injuries and guys that are out of circulation. That'd sure. be helpful. Thank you. We have a minimum uh, shift strength of 10. So we staff two engines and a ladder truck and an ambulance. So on, on each engine at, at 10, we'll, we'll have three on, on each engine, so that's six personnel. We'll have two on the ladder truck and two on the ambulance. You can't run an engine effectively with two people on it. One person is operating the, the pump on it. You have one person that can open and close the hose, but nobody's to assist to bring it into the house. So to, to staff that engine effectively, you need at least three people. And then you, you're going to need a fourth to really get that line up to a second floor. Our shift strength has 11 personnel, so we can have one person on vacation without creating the need for overtime. If we, the contract allows them to have two people on vacation, and so when we go below that 10, it, it incurs an overtime cost. Sometimes we go below that because of a vacation, a, um, somebody might be injured, or somebody might be sick. So those are the things that drive the overtime. But to have a... Um, you know, you can't have an ambulance with one person on it. Nobody's treating the patient, so that's why this, th that's why there's a minimum. And you know, the NFPA has done a number of studies. A, um, a, f a piece of fire apparatus staffed with four is considered 100% effective. When you drop that staffing down to, to three, it's considered 75% effective. You drop it to two, it's considered 50% effective. So we're we're generally at the at the for our pumps at the three range, except for when the fire prevention officer is working. Then our downtown pump is at two. Thank you. If if we're able to increase our staffing, now we'll keep the downtown pump at three more often when the fire prevention officer is working. So our, our full-time uh, FTEs, in <coughs> FY17, we had 49.5 FTEs. In FY18, we, we lost a position through attrition, and we're down to 48.5 FTEs. With the FY19 request, that would bring us up to 53 FTEs. We're, we're requesting uh, four firefighter positions and also a half-time administrative position that we would share with the police department. Right now the department has one administrative assistant and so this would provide us some depth for vacations and things. Um, our administrative assistant does the payroll and a lot of administrative stuff. When, when she's not there, she's so good to us she'll, she'll come in on a Sunday when she takes vacation to get the payroll out. And unfortunately, she's retiring in February, so we're, we're kind of up against it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that position will give us a little bit more depth 
but it would also assist the police department. Their administrative functions are increasing at a much higher rate. And I, I think a lot of the time would be used at the police station, but, but again, we would need that in certain, certain times when we have a big project to get out or when um, uh, cover for vacation or illnesses. Our, our payroll is done very similar with the same uh, software system. You're touching on another topic briefly there, and Chief, uh, this concept of sense of duty and sense of commitment. You, keep, you know, get, yeah. you, getting people to come in on the weekend, you, you can't hire for that, right? That's that's from the heart. That's not it from is, the line. It is, yep. And I didn't ask her to do it, and she just does it. It's just, it's really good. And, you know, she she, she does it for us, and she does it for the firefighters. It's, 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 it's a wonderful thing, it really is. And uh, both the assistant and I really Assistant Chief and I really appreciate it. Uh, kind of got off track a little bit. Uh, in, in August of 2017, we did an internal study to determine how the Reading Fire Department compares with the comparable communities that were outlined by the Finance Committee. And we looked at the 25 pair of communities, and we were looking at uh, staffing to see how we <coughs> compared with them. Um, and we looked at a lot of different areas. I won't go into every specific one, but we looked at what's the population of these communities, what's the total staffing of them, what's the minimum staffing, how many firefighters per thousand do they have, and also do they provide uh, emergency medical services like us? Because when you do that, you have much more uh, demands and training, but also you're sending people out of town on the ambulance, so you're staffing another piece of equipment. So you, you, you not only have to worry about fire, EMS, and has, hazmat, but you have to worry about um, transporting uh, injured people. So when we looked at the, um, the 25 peer communities, we saw that Reading was on the higher end of the population. We ranked nine out of the 25. How many of those have EMS? Um, I indicated, Sailors you can see there. the initials in the uh, parentheses, yeah. about, I want to say about uh, 14 to 16 of them, 16 or so, uh, maybe a little bit higher, but you can see. I indicated whether they're at the <coughs> basic life support level when they provide EMS or at the advanced life support level. Okay. So let's see, how did that? 14. You know, like what does Wakefield have? Do. Wakefield's not indicated there. That's Wakefield does not provide yeah. EMS. It's right in the middle. Oh, no. Right. So if there's no indication like Wakefield, EMS. Stoneham, yeah. Dedham, uh, Shrewsbury, uh, Milton, Danvers, they don't provide EMS at all. <coughs> For our surrounding communities, um, uh, North Reading, they provide uh, ALS level service. Linfield, an ALS level service. Uh, Wakefield doesn't provide EMS. Um, Stoneham doesn't provide EMS. Uh, Wuben provides a basic life uh, support service. So in a, in a mutual aid situation, we're, we have surrounding towns that aren't even up to the level of service that we provide. Yeah. We'd be relying on these towns. Right. <coughs> when we do, we'll bring in a, a, a mutual aid ambulance from Wuben, but sometimes we have to bring in a uh, paramedic unit as well. Yeah. That that puts a punctuation point on the yeah. exclamation point on what you're asking for here. That's going to ripple through everything you talk about. It does. It does. It, I'm, I'm gonna, it's, 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 it's kind of a good story, too, because you see the level of care the patients uh, receive. The services are great, but, you know, what, you it, what, I guess what it means is that, and I do know how good it is, um, <laughs> I, but what it, you know, one of the things that happens is, your staff levels, by the nature of what you're doing, has to be, if you think about it in the peer community standpoint, I mean, you got to have more fire, you have to have more personnel just on the baseline of being able to provide what you provide. Right. We're, 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 with the firefighters that are assigned to the unit, to the uh, ambulance, they're providing double duty. Right. They're providing EMS services that if the community doesn't, they're bringing a private company to take care of that. Right. So we're doing it with our firefighters, so they're doing a dual duty, but we also send them out of town to the to the hospital, and they can be gone an hour, a little bit longer, depending upon what the traffic is, how busy the hospital is at that time. So we lose those people. 
So, you know, we say our minimum is 10, but a lot of times we're down to eight because we've sent them out of town. Sometimes we've sent them with a third person. In, in extreme situations, that we've sent them with two additional firefighters in the back because the patient is so critical. Right. Or, so so we've, we've lost a significant part of the department, but you, know, you, you take care of the patient. Well, the value proposition by comparison also is that you know, more training, people here are more experienced, costs go up, I get that, but in a relative way to buying it on a contract basis, we are really double dipping here, yeah. Um, yeah. In, in a in a big way, and I and I'm not sure that everybody. We take you for granted. We take all of you that are up here for granted, in my opinion. In that in this regard, you know what's delivered for what's spent. It's just you know an observation. Thank you. Thank you. We try to give the best service that we can with, with the with the people that we have. Uh, we also. Um, so when we looked at our total staffing compared to our fair communities, um, sir, oh, this is terrible. How did they get supported? I was thinking maybe my aspect Right, a, a community that provides a basic level. Okay. Chief, of Chief, can you repeat the question? We're having a real trouble. Well, folks can stand up when they actually yeah. ask the question. Should be helpful if you use the mic. Oh, if you use the mic, people in the room can't hear you. Yeah. Um, Nobody no, right here. Oh, yeah, sorry. The, the acoustics in this room are so good, we can't hear anything. <laughs> so I was looking for clarification, which you answer in that discussion. When I saw so many neighboring communities that don't have ALS, right. what are they relying on? And you said private companies. So they're relying on private companies. Yes, services. Yeah, they'll have a contract with a, with a private uh, company to provide nice. that level of service. They'll transport to but they'll, re they'll require a <coughs> company to come in to assist. Mm -hmm. And I also know we're able to bill insurance companies yes. and bill back for a lot of this. Yes. What percent of the cost of ha having ALS would you say is covered by what we're able to claim and bill back? You mean the, the cost of the service compared to yeah. what we bring in? Well, it's probably somewhat of a break-even okay. situation. We're not yeah. making money, but right. we're, we're but we're not, we're not losing, losing a lot, money. But we're Correct. A lot stronger service. Yes, yeah. we might yeah. come out ahead a little bit. It depends on how you look at it. We pay a stipend to the firefighters. We have to buy the ambulance. We have to buy the disposable supplies, and we have to train and recertify. So there's some real significant costs in there. But we do bring in, um, you know, in the eight hundred thousand dollar range. Mm -hmm. So that offsets um, a lot of those costs. And the real key thing is that we get to choose who's providing that level of service and what their training is. When you when you deal with a private company, you don't know who you, they're gonna provide you two paramedics that are qualified, but they could be brand new paramedics or they could you know, have 25 years experience. You don't know. Right. You don't have any control of that. Control. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't know where that ambulance is coming from. They could, that ambulance could be in another community. Mm -hmm. It's not, not necessarily gonna be in your community. I see it's huge asset. It's great. Yeah. Right. Chief, two other questions. Do you have a view of this with regard to the to the manpower assessment as well? Yes. And then um, at some point, can you speak to the impact on overtime reduction that the proposed addition might potentially benefit? I okay. can I, I don't have it in this presentation. I can estimate it. I can just take a wild guess. At, at an appropriate time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we looked at the peer communities. We, we saw that the Reading was on the higher end for population and the firefighter staffing was on the lower end <coughs> on, on each of the categories that we looked at. <coughs> so when we looked at um, the total number of firefighters in each of the departments in the comparable communities, Reading ranked 15 out of 25. And like the discussion we're ha having, it's important to note that not all of those departments are providing EMS services. And then when you look at the ratio of the number of firefighters per thousand citizens, um, the average fire department staffing for the comparable communities was 1.97 firefighters per thousand citizens. In Reading ranks at the eighth lowest staffing. Our average is 1.78 firefighters per thousand citizens. And this is below the community 
uh, comparable community average. To bring us up to the average would require four additional firefighters. And in this, um, nice stuff there for sure, Chief. Sorry to interrupt. That's all right. <coughs> um, that doesn't work for this room. Um, Wayfield that doesn't provide ALS has more firefighters per thousand citizens than we do and we provide ALS yes. with with uh, quite quite uh, fewer staff hmm. does that chart change dramatically chief if um, you just look at the operational the, the, the guys on the four teams as opposed to the chief, the assistant chief. Do you expect the rankings to change much if you just look at it in terms of the positions you're adding and the functions they do only? If, if we add these positions, will we need to add other positions? No, does the ranking here change materially if you just look at the 44 going to, sorry, 41 going to 45 as yeah, opposed it to the would bring us if, if we added four, it would bring us to the average. Okay, either way. Yeah. Thank you. This, this slide um, illustrates the minimum number of firefighters on duty in each of the de fire departments in the comparable communities. In this comparison, Reading ranks um, 13 out of 25. So we also looked at a study that was done in 1987 by, um, by a company called George Paul Fire Safety Consultants. It was done before the, the Main Street Fire Station was built. A lot of that study looked at um, siting of the of the fire station, but also looked at uh, staffing and, and other things. And when that report was written um, back in 1987, uh, the on-duty group strength was 11 personnel, which is the same as it is today. In that report, they recommended an increase in staffing by four personnel. The, the report examined uh, emergency response data for 1986 and 1987, and at that time, the emergency call volume was 2,500 responses per year. And since then, we've seen our responses exceed 3,500 per year. And that's a 40% increase in call volume. The population also listed in the report was approximately 24,000. And since then, we've seen uh, the population grow to over 26,000. And also, when that report was written, we didn't have the major projects that we've, we've seen come in since then. This is some of the examples were <coughs> Redding Woods, uh, Redding Commons, uh, Johnson Woods, uh, Walk the Walkersbrook Drive development. Uh, and I don't believe the Gazebo Circle development was in then. And um, so there's, there's been a significant change in kind of in the four corners of the community when you look at it. We also examined the Town of Reading's Economic Development Action Plan, uh, 2016 to 2022, created by the MAPC, Metropolitan Area Planning Council, uh, to offer insights to future development. And the MAPC predicted a substantial <coughs> need for housing and significant growth in the senior population of Reading in the near future. The trend of the new growth uh, consists of uh, multi-floor, multi-unit wood frame buildings and multi-floor, multi-unit would frame mixed-use residential commercial buildings is likely to continue. Also, the um, factors of an increasing population and an increasing senior population and an increased number of large residential buildings will combine to cause an increased responses for, for us. Let's jump in a little bit to our uh, emergency responses. Uh, these responses are just from uh, January 1st of this year to uh, December 1st of this year. And during that time period, we responded to 3,543 emergency calls for assistance. That's a little bit of a breakdown in the type of calls that, we're gonna, that we respond to. Many of the fire department's responses require more than one piece of fire apparatus on scene. And these would be uh, emergency medical calls, fires, motor vehicle accidents, construction accidents, hazardous material incidents, and flammable liquid spills. An example would be a motor vehicle accident on the highway, 128 or, or 93. It's not unusual for us to send a, an engine, a ladder truck, and an ambulance up there. If there are significant injuries on scene, the call will require the entire shift. 
Uh, all fire departments uh, in the state are required to report response data to the state fire marshal's office. Reading's required reporting data from January 1 to December 1, uh, 2017, included 20 fi 28 fires defined as structure fires, nine fires of mobile equipment, and 21 outside fires in addition to other responses. And one of those fires was pretty big. Yeah, one of them was pretty big, yeah. Unfortunately for the people that lived there, but yeah, that, that, that for us, it's, we count that as one incident, but we were there um, for that, that day, over 12 hours that day, back the next day, and then the next day after that. And we, we had um, 17 engines, uh, six ladder trucks, five towers, over 120 firefighters. It was a significant response. <coughs> Chief, do you have a view? This is, can you back up? Yeah, could you yeah. back up on that? Yeah. That's a view of the data from somebody picking up the phone and saying, I need help. And these are the kinds of requests yes. they made. Yes. But it's not a view of the consumption of time from the department to serve that customer. To your point earlier, that one building fire, I'm sure would be a lot bigger than that really small slice of pie. Fires in general, I assume, are bigger than one fire can be tie up the whole group, for example. Yes. Is there a view of, this that of the data by use or by <coughs> how much of the capacity of the department is consumed? No, I've often thought about doing that. As, you know, the num number of pieces of equipment, like on, on a time basis, I've, I've thought about doing it. Our data doesn't. Our you can't get it that way automatically. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it just so when you look at that, when I see it, looks like there's a, a slice that says fire protection system active. Are those false alarms? Yes, that would be um, a system activated in a building. It could be caused by um, That could be my wife by herself. It could be somebody caused by cooking. <laughs> it could be um, a system that's malfunctioned. It, it, does it include malicious uh, fire? There is one a malicious call. It's very, it's, it's right to the right of that, right at the top. Okay. It's, we don't have a lot of it, so it's basically a line. All right, thank uh, you. Fortunately, we don't have a lot of that. So the um, assist the resident, um, that's a pretty big slice too, from a, a frequency standpoint, and I'm suspecting that's going to go up. Yes. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that you get all ages, of course, but as you have a, an aging population, there may be more calls. I mean, do you, have you ever looked at, do you have any idea? We are, and we're really tracking that. It, within that assist the resident is um, assist a person that's handicapped. They might have fallen. Right. And, and they need just, they need to be, they need to be helped up. They, they need just a, a little bit of help. And we've seen that increase substantially the last couple of years. And so, we code that separately, but, I, but I've grouped a number of like calls together to, yeah. to have a pie chart that can really paint the picture. But that's something that's, that's definitely on the increase. A lot of sicker people are at home now. Right. And you know, a lot of people are working. And well, people are sent home earlier from the hospital. I mean, that that's whole. Correct, yeah. A lot of elderly people are by themselves right. and, and they may need just a little bit of help. Yeah. Yeah, this, I don't know if this crosses over more to dispatch, but uh, the call boxes on the telephone poles, those date back probably 100 years. Are they still used by people to report incidents? They are still used. That's connected to the municipal system. And and it also connects school buildings, yeah. uh, the library, uh, 52 Sanborn Street. That's how we got that call. No kidding. Through that system. Wow. So it's an old system. Yep. You know, we could take those boxes off the telephone poles, yep. but we'd still need to maintain the system. You're required. Because to. that's our reporting for the schools, okay. all the public buildings. And then we like to have them in buildings that we consider high hazard. Okay. Because otherwise, it goes through a central station. If they don't pay their bill, they're going to get cut off. We may not know about that. Mm -hmm. They're required to have it, but it could be cut off. And the other thing is the central station, the alarm company has 90 seconds to turn that call around. Mm -hmm. So they'll take that and then it, they have 90 seconds. So that's a long delay. Yeah. 52 Sanborn Street, we got it very early. And I couldn't imagine what that would be like if we got a 90 second delay on that. Right, very good. Thank so, you. So it's, it's a little bit of a cost for us to maintain it out into the street. But they are being used. 
but we need it for the building. <coughs> and it is useful. Um, emergency medical responses are, are continuing on an upward trend. This is an this is a um, kind of a, a look at the types of calls that we're responding to it as a percentage, and you can you can see um, you know I know I mean, still a little bit of the police chief's thunder. I know one of the calls that he sees increasing is um, psychiatric problems. Um, you can see that's a large slice of the responses that we're going on. We see that as an increase. Um, you know, we see uh, lots of falls, uh, we see uh, traumatic injuries, um, traffic transportation incidents, um, allergic reactions, um, breathing problems. So we see a, a very wide range of uh, patients. Chief, where would um, opiate, responding to an opiate individual? It's um, down, or, down around the uh, 8 o'clock position. <coughs> uh, overdose Oh, poisoning. sorry, thank you, thank you. And then um, there's... And you'll see another slide. Um, the next slide will show medications given. So from January 1st to December 1st, we responded to uh, 2,073 emergency medical calls. When we compare the data for the same time period last year, uh, those responses were 1,853. So we had a 11.8% increase from last year to this. It would be interesting. I, I know in, in an earlier slide, you were showing a comparison from, you know, a number of years ago. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, the numbers of available numbers haven't changed for your team, really. But that last slide you had up there, uh, it would be interesting to know in 1986 how many uh, overdoses and psychiatric. I bet, I bet the difference is night and day. I bet, yeah, it know. would be. I agree. Uh, yeah, we wouldn't see as many overdoses. Um, the, this, this slide indicates um, the medications uh, given to patients this year, but it also uh, illustrates how sophisticated the treatments that, that the firefighters can give, all the different medications that firefighters can give in the patient's house or in the ambulance on the, on the way to the hospital. It's, it's, it's really amazing. You know, th this, this wasn't possible um, 15 years ago. <coughs> So we, we went to the ALS level in, 2000, in uh, 2003, so it's kind of new. Before that, these medications weren't given by us. We had, we'd have to bring in a private company to do that. And back in when the report was written in 1987, uh, I don't think there was ALS available to the community at all. That, that just came into place right around that time. You guys are pharmacists <laughs> while you're fighting fires. Huh? They are, you know, and all those medications have to be calculated based upon the patient's weight. So they can't just, not like a standard dose, they have to calculate it. Uh, this, this slide is an indication of um, the demographics of the patients we're transporting. And the 55 and over is um, a significant part of the patients that we're transporting. Which is our fastest growing segment of the population. Yes, yeah. Might be interesting to look at a cut of that based on the building type. Is it a single family home or one of the multifamily identities as well? Yeah. Just be curious if that's any better or worse or is it just bigger because there's more. We're going to nerd you to death with this yeah. stuff. <laughs> I'm just curious. I don't think it drives any decision making. Well, I guess that curious. means we're going to fund the half a position for his clerical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, with, we, we do have assistant living. Uh, facilities that have come to Reading that have resulted in increased call volume. Right. And we do have um, uh, complexes that are specifically for um, older population that, that we do respond to quite regularly. Uh, this, this is kind of a, um, a, a slide that shows uh, the EMS responses uh, going up in the, in the blue line and the total fire department staffing in the red line uh, kind of going down and flattening out. So you can see our, our call volume is continually marching upwards. Is the data for 06 through 14 really flat for firefighters? Is that actually what the real data said? It kind of dropped, it, it, we, it drops off with that loss of position. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, sh it, it shouldn't pop this up is, I'm sorry, this is staffing, it's not activity, I'm sorry. Yeah. We have added. 1970. Okay, now I understand, thank yeah. you. There's no new, there's 
Almost. No net new people. Got it. We're, got we're it. less. Got it. Okay. Last year, year over year, we're down one. Sorry. Um, this does say that we're going to have to, on the capital side, think about more ambulances and less <laughs> fire trucks. <laughs> Put a trailer on it. Well, actually, we have a lot of ambulances. Every everything in this picture here is an ambulance. We registered all our fire our first line fire apparatus are registered as class five ambulances that allows us to put als medical supplies on that ambulance if we didn't register it we, we couldn't provide it so you got all that stuff on a pump or two yeah so our two pumps that are in service and our ladder truck in service whenever there's a paramedic on one of those trucks which is basically all the time that the, bag comes on with them that bag comes yeah. on with them so other than transport, everything else is duplicated across the fleet. Right, and we do that because our ambulance could be at the hospital for an hour, right. and we have a paramedic on the scene. I want to make sure they have the tools that they can treat that patient. Right. So they have the, the big 12-lead um, defibrillator monitor. They have the medication, so they just they just go right to work. We'll bring in another ambulance, but the patient's going to be stabilized and, and treated, and then, and then off they go. So this, um, this is... Of our 25 comparable communities, only one runs a system like ours, and that's Belmont. Canton has one piece of fire apparatus that they registered as an ALS ambulance. So this is kind of not this is this is a big thing in kind of in the state to do. It's un, it's unusual for, for fire departments to do that. Chief, you're to be commended for doing that. This is kind of on one hand. Why wouldn't you do it? On the other hand, as you just said, mm -hmm. you're leading the pack. This is a way to get more leverage out of the fleet. Right, right. It's yep. you know, I couldn't think of anything more frustrating to be a paramedic, but to have that training and not mm -hmm. be able to use it on somebody that needs right. it. Right, exactly. Yeah. There are a lot of AEDs around town out in the field, but I really wonder how many people would really know how to use one in a pinch. Are there any trainings that you're able to offer with your limited resources, or that the state can offer? With, with uh, I'm, starting, I'm trying to get a program up and running. We have a, one of our new people is interested in doing that. Yeah. And I'm trying to get a new program up and running. I need to talk to the town manager about it. And I mean, that's a preliminary discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, I'd like it to pay for itself, where it mm -hmm. goes out and does some training for a group. Yep. And then they pay a fee to pay for those costs. So it's like revenue neutral. I see. But mechanically, we'd have to handle those funds, and that's how we have to decide to do that. Chief, could you just, sorry, back up to the picture? Um, I just wanted to, I, I, I think there's a, a misperception in town um, of when a call goes in and three vehicles show up to an event. And you've explained it to me, but could you just uh, explain it again so that people understand why um, more than one vehicle shows up to uh, a house sure. on any given occasion? Sure. So for a routine medical, we'll send in a, uh, we'll, we'll dispatch the ambulance and, and, the, and a piece of fire apparatus, depending upon how we've divided up the town. The west side station, it will be the west side engine. Downtown, it could be the, uh, the engine or the ladder truck, depending upon how we've done it. So the, the firefighters on the uh, ambulance will go in and they'll, they'll bring in a big defibrillator monitor. They'll bring in a, um, a medication drug box, a first in bag, and then um, oxygen. So they're coming in with a boatload of supplies to start treating that patient. The firefighters on, on the fire apparatus, sometimes they can be there, sometimes they're there first. But also they have to set up the stretcher and, and they have to assist in carrying that patient out and then bringing in any other equipment that may be needed. Many people are up on the second floor of their home and many people you have to carry out and you, you need more than two people to do it. If you tried to do that job with just two people, you'd have a tremendous amount of injuries and you just burn those people out. By bringing the other resources in, you're able to efficiently get those to, to treat the people and get them out. But also, as the paramedics are treating, one of the other members is gathering 
um, medical data are about them, about the condition, you know, how acute is it, how, what their medical history is, what their medications are, and things like that. So a lot goes into uh, taking care of a, a medical call. So that's why when they see two fire trucks pull up, they see two am an ambulance and a fire truck pull up. It's like, well, I just called the ambulance. Why do I have that? And then sometimes the police show up. Um, sometimes they can be there first, you know, but they'll they'll be there to assist us as well. Thanks. Yeah. Does the equipment on that second truck get used frequently? I understand the need for additional manpower, but do you actually need the vehicle itself? Is that uh, we need the vehicle because that's what they're assigned to. So it. if they need okay. to break away to something else, they're all ready to go. Ready to go. All right. Yeah. Thank so you. if the if the engine or the ladder truck was the second piece in, they wouldn't necessarily grab their medical equipment off that, that truck, but they would be going to the ambulance and they'll get the stretcher, set the stretcher up. And then generally what has to go into the home is called a stair chair. It's a small folding chair. That has to be brought in, set up, um, and patient lifted on it and comfortably co covered with blankets. And so there's a fair amount that goes into packaging them up efficiently. And then all that equipment needs to get out of, get out of the house okay. stored away. Got it. You know, it's the equipment that they have to come in has increased significantly over the years. It used to be just two bags, and now it's yeah. very large bags. That the defibrillator monitor is a very sophisticated device, and they can't give medications unless they apply that, read the strip, and before before they go. Uh, that, that's just a slide for our ambulance revenue for the last uh, eight fiscal years. Bob, when did we touch um, f fees? Was that 16 or this would seem to say it's 15? It's 15. Do you recall it was 15, 16? 15. Yeah, 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 I think I, it was 15. I, I think the bump you see is from the increase to the fees. Yeah. I would have thought it would have been more than Because it was fairly flat and then it just spiked up. Thank you. And, and this is where the revenue is coming from. You can see the different insurance companies that it's coming from. Medicare, although they don't reimburse, they reimburse at a lower level is a, is a fair amount of the revenue that we get. But that's <coughs> of our population that we're treating, a high percentage, high percentage of them are on Medicare. Those are dollars. Do you, again, have a sense of the number of patients that are either uninsured or self-insured? Uh, yeah, I could run those figures. In, in our community, we have a, a lot of people have insurance. Um, some don't. Occasionally we come across somebody with a hardship, and um, there's a process that they go through uh, to... Um, so sometimes... So if there's a hardship, we'll, we'll, we'll assist them where we can. Yep. And there's a process for that. Uh, many people have insurance. What we've seen is their co-pays have gone up considerably. And that's where you see the self-pay has gone up, Excellent. and um, you know some of the some of the co pays on, on some of them are, are, are high. Yeah. You know, yeah, it could be yeah, it could be a couple hundred or more. Uh, just quickly on uh, emergency management, um, the, the primary goal for emergency management is I, to identify areas of vulnerability for the community and to prepare for disasters whether natural or man-made, and to um, coordinate response of a wide range of agencies and to assist in the recovery phase. And the secondary goal is to make sure that we're uh, in compliance with any state or <coughs> requirement so we're eligible for disaster uh, reimbursements. So over the last, I want to say probably, so since 2001, We've seen an increase in uh, storm events being eligible for uh, presidential disaster declarations. And this is a graph of, of um, the funds that we've received back from uh, FEMA since 2001. So over that time period, both uh, the town of Reading and uh, Reading Municipal Light have received uh, just under $1.4 million. So it's a considerable amount of money. So just in uh, closing, uh, the fire department, as with other town departments, has seen uh, considerable changes in our area of responsibility. And it's due to increases in population, changes in demographics, new development, uh, changes in the world around us. And it's resulted in an increased demand for emergency responses. 
and also increased uh, reporting responsibilities. And these issues have required us to plan, develop, and provide new training programs and also add new equipment to our fire apparatus. So, uh, thanks for having me tonight, and I'd be happy to answer any, any questions you may have. Questions from the board. Uh, just, just one real quick, Chief. Um, so, um, on the operational side, was, you know, you made a pretty compelling case for sort of adding to staff. Um, with all the um, the new projects in town, many of which are four and five stories, do you anticipate needing additional capital equipment, like for example, another ladder, which is a million bucks a pop fully? Uh, no, I don't anticipate any heavy equipment like that. No, no. But with those buildings come a potential. And, and they come with increased population, increased demands. You know, they all have alarm systems, so occasionally they malfunction. Residents that need medical care, um, you know, a cooking fire, you know. So there's, they all bring responses. And the, the type of construction is concerning. And it's also concerning, as we see in the news, when it's under construction. You know, you have this very large um, Wood you know, frames vertical it's lumber pile. It's a matchbox. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, that was Chief, one question. I, it's not mine. It's actually from a citizen. I feel embarrassed to ask it, but they shall remain anonymous. Um, the question was how feasible it is, or it's actually much more direct than that, but how feasible it is to actually close one of the two fire stations. And this, this individual was poking at the one on uh, West Street. West, uh, West Street. West side of town. Yeah, I'm over here. Well, there's no money in closing the fire station because uh, all our, the, about 96% of our budget is in salaries. So if you close the station, you're not going to save any money. To, if you take an engine uh, company out of service, you save money. But but the thing is that it puts the population at risk. When we send a, uh, when we have a car accident up on the highway, we have to send a, an engine up there. So we're, we're right in the uh, intersection of 128 and 93. We're up on the highway all the time. So uh, when a fire call comes in, they need to get out of the highway on rush hour and then respond to it. So it, it creates kind of an unworkable situation for us that's dangerous. You have one engine. Uh, where you have a limited water supply at 70, 750 gallons of water, you don't have another pump to supply it. So, I, it's 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 um that so it it's not a it's not a safe choice for the community, and just closing the station and bringing people downtown only increases the, the emergency response to the west side of the town. And over the west side of town, we have a, we have a school, Joshua Eaton School, that's not completely sprinkled, only, it's only partially sprinkled. We have, um, we have, uh, we have, uh, we have Parker, we have um, Austin Prep, we have uh, the Johnson Woods Complex in there to protect, we have uh, Archstone to protect, uh, and then also that station responds to uh, Gazebo Circle, which is a large number of um, apartment buildings that aren't sprinkled. Five Washington Street uh, that's not sprinkled. Buildings one through three Summit Drive are six-story buildings that aren't sprinkled. Um, so it, it has, and then, um, uh, let's see, uh, 237 to 241 Main Street, uh, those apartment buildings aren't, aren't sprinkled. 307, 309 Main Street, 363 Main Street. It just goes on and on. So I'm really yeah. impressed how you can do that. <laughs> so I think the citizen so got his or her some, answer. And we're also divided by the railroad tracks. We sure. see that you know we all get stuck with the commuter <laughs> railroad tracks. You see what Warren Street is like sometimes when the train comes through. So yes, Bonnie got the guy. <laughs> so it's it's something that was talked about in 1987 to to close that station to bring everybody down to the downtown station and create a bigger fire station, to, to build a five, day, a five bay fire station that would have a mechanics bay and then enough space to run right. 11 people. <coughs> but they decided not to purchase the house next door <coughs> or take it by eminent domain, so it became a smaller station. But ever since that, 1987, when that, that study came out to bring people downtown, that has just 
came up over and over and during budget cuts, well, we should close the West Side Station. And <coughs> What are you gonna What are you gonna save by closing the station? You still need the personnel, and, and you, you're not you can't really run an effective fire department with. You really need two engines and a ladder truck to make an effective um, fire attack on just a small home, and to try to do it with um, with two engines or one engine and a ladder truck is 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 just uh, not gonna make it. It's not gonna be safe for the community or the firefighters. Well, thanks. I, I expected that response, and again, that if it's asked by one citizen, I'm guessing there's more than uh, oh, yeah. several others yeah. that will have the same kind of question. Yeah. Uh, I've asked. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's it's a it's very not an unreasonable, unreasonable question. It's not an unreasonable question, but the answer, yeah. you know, kind of puts it to sleep. I think it demands uh, a detailed analysis of why and the conditions and the risks and mitigations. So, I appreciate all the detail. I'm, I'm impressed. You have an encyclopedic memory of sprinkler buildings <laughs> in Reading. <laughs> <laughs> And you know the other thing is we don't we don't have the space downtown to to accommodate everybody, you know, the entire shift. We just we just don't. <coughs> Thank any you very questions? much. Any other questions? We have a few here, Chief. Before sure. you leave, I'll just go around the room. Elaine, you, you may have to come up because this room is like dead quiet in the back. We can't hear you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Elaine Webb, Precinct 1. Question on the chart uh, where you had all the communities and the number of firefighters, mm -hmm. so we were 1.78. Yes. That left that list. I was just wondering if you um, overlay or look at the data of square area, what does that, does that tell us in terms of where we are? So for those communities, um, like I just think that Andover is a community that's a 30 square larger. miles. Yeah, 30 square miles probably. Right, and I think they were at a little over 2 or 2.0. So I'm just wondering if you've looked at it and, and what impact does that have, um, this <coughs> area? I did look at it. Yeah. And, um, you know, a community that, that's denser and has houses and things that are closer together and, and generally results in more responses than a community that's spread out. If you're in a community that's spread out, generally you have longer response times, but it's more rural. So you know, Andover has kind of a mix. You know, they have some areas that are spread out, but they have some areas that are congested. Um, so, uh, but I, I did look at it. But I, but I thought it was most effective to look at uh, population because that's that's what drives uh, our responses, and not not square miles. I appreciated uh, understanding that all the fire apparatus are actually ambulances. Yep. I've often, you know, seen something go out and you know, like, you know, it's not a fire. It was some sort of more ambulance. I'm like, why are they bringing the big fire truck and you know, wasting all that money? But clearly, it's um, it's really an ambulance as well as the fire truck. Right. Um, and I, I just, I, in terms of, um, sorry, that's three questions. That's fine. There's no limit here. The mate. What, like wear and tear, like the impact. I was just wondering, so sort of what the biggest issues are for the wear and tear on the trucks? So, right, every time you take a truck out, um, you know, what's the biggest thing? I, I, I was thinking that driving um, on driving south on South Main Street might be one of the biggest wear and tear factors <laughs> on the power trucks. But I just was kind of yeah, they, there is wear and tear on. They do break down. On, an, on a fire engine, we'll get 20 years out of a fire engine. Our, the last one that went that we just traded in was in, was in 1995, so we've got 22 years out of that. Um, so they'll do 10 years as a first line fire truck and then uh, 10 years as a backup. So we get full 20 years out of them. Our ladder truck, you know, we're we looking at getting between 15 and 17 years out of it. Um, you know, the so it, it does cause wear and tear, but it's something that we've been doing in this department and, and many other departments for, for I, decades. I was just wondering if like, the ambulance, the usage of the trucks, of the fire apparatus as ambulance, was in any way you know, accelerating that from more trips I should No, by uh, registering it as, as ambulances, we were just able to upgrade the equipment that we carry on them. So we didn't increase their responses. A lot of times, when the ambulance is out, because we get back-to-back -back medical calls quite frequently, so the ambulance could be out. We're waiting for an ambulance to come from, say, uh, North Reading. They're, they're ALS, but we can start that ALS level of care as soon as we arrive on scene with that with that piece of fire apparatus. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Mark? <coughs> thank you, 
Thank you. Hey, Chief. Um, I know that John asked this question, and I wasn't sure if it was answered. You said you're going to come back to us, but the question about with four additional people, yeah, what impact you thought that would have on overtime? I, I'm just a, a ballpark, and you can't really, you know, one of the things that drives it, you know, who's going to retire in, in injuries and things, and I don't know if, when somebody would get injured and, and things, but I would imagine it would result in a reduction in overtime in, in, in the $100,000 range, maybe a little bit more. Uh, it could be better. It, it de just depends upon what the injury rate is and things. And hopefully, with some additional help, it could reduce the injury factor. So, pay for four. Paula, get four, pay for three. Easy. Sorry to make you run up here. thinking a little bit of like my dovetails, my <coughs> question dovetails with that. Um, with the additional four firefighters, and you might have gone into this, would you change your minimum requirement or you'd put more? on staff at once, how do you? They would all be assigned to a group, so the groups would go from 11 to 12. Okay. So if I had two people on vacation, right, yeah. if I had two people on vacation, we don't have to hire now. Mm -hmm. So your minimum stays at 10. Right, it would stay at 10. We wouldn't then increase the minimum to 11. Yeah. It would stay as it is. Okay, thanks. But when everybody is in, they'd have a, a much more effective response because they'd be at 12. Right. Other questions before we move on? Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Good job. Sorry, it took some time. Great job. Thank you. We don't often get the chance to see you other than when something's on fire, so it's nice to just have a calm discussion. Yeah. Look different without the hat. Good evening tonight. Thank you for having myself uh, as well tonight. Mark Segal, Chief of Police. Also with me is uh, Dave Clark, your Deputy Chief of Police here in the town of Reading. Um, I'd like to start as well by showing you our organizational chart currently. Uh, one police chief, one deputy. We have four division commanders, which are lieutenants, each in charge of the division, uh, support services, criminal division, day shift, and night shift. We have seven sergeants, which are all in the patrol division, two assigned to the day shift, and five assigned to the night shift. Each of the three platoons at night have four officers assigned to each platoon. Uh, the day platoons uh, each have, four, uh, sorry, one has four, one has three. The one with three was the cut budget cut from last year that we took the officer, uh, we dropped from 42 officers to 41. Um, we have six officers assigned to the detective division. One is the, the uh, school resource officer. One is assigned to a drug task force with the FBI. And the other four are assigned to the, de the, the detective division on a daily basis. Uh, in the support services division, we have the safety officer, the armor, the fleet maintenance officer, community service officer and then we have a, a civilian personnel person who does parking enforcement and animal control. Parking enforcement is done 18 hours a week right now and animal control is at 13. And right now in the records office we have two clerks which are our full-time 37 and a half week positions right now currently. So that's it. I just want to give you a quick overview of that before we get started. I did mind on a Word doc, it's not like breaks in a, uh, in a PowerPoint, but kind of similar to last year's. <coughs> Basically, the beginning right here goes over from the October 10th meeting when I did the staffing study in front of the board. Um, I'm requesting an additional five additional officers. And this is based on the area of focus that we looked at back in the summer were population, sworn officers, civilian employees, school resource officers, detectives, task force officers, <coughs> Dispatches, calls for service, population density, housing unit density, command staff levels, and police department budgets of 22 comparable towns that we compared ourselves to that we were able to get results back uh, back over the summer. Uh, the last time a study like this was conducted was in 1998 by a company, EMS Consultants out of Belmont, New Hampshire. Back then, the company concluded that 
uh, department at the time should have had between 43 and 44 sworn officers. Uh, it was important to note back then that the population of, as of 2000 was 23,700 people. Um, since then, Walkers Book Drive, the Jordan's Home Depot, several restaurants and retail stores has grown. Uh, also, we've had several licensed bars and nightclubs come into on Walkers Book as well. Our cost for service has, has grown significantly uh, to the result of that, that area, as well as the several uh, apartment complexes that have, have come in the last several years as well. Uh, our current population as of the other day was 26,656 people in the town already, according to our town clerk. Again, I'm asking for five additional officers, three to fill the night shifts, one to fill the current opening on day shift, and an additional school resource officer to help out with the uh, the calls for service at the uh, high school, <coughs> high school level, primarily, and the half uh, the half administrator as well. I'm sorry, yeah, the half administrator position, which would help out. Right now, currently, the laws changed last year with the uh, the um, <coughs> records, yeah, public records law, and we've had, our calls haven't. Gone, I mean, our, our public record requests haven't gone up a l much more than last year. However, the length to, to, yeah. to actually look into them and actually digest them for the, for the public is taking much longer per request. <coughs> okay. right. Staffing, wages. Wages are up 13.7% for this budget request. Again, that's the five additional officers that we're requesting, as well as the half of the uh, uh, Clerk that we're requesting as well. The expenses are up 16.7% on this request, and most of that is due to membership dues for some of the actual memberships that we belong to the NEMLIC, uh, the Mass Chiefs, Major City Chiefs, the uh, International Association of Chiefs of Police Association. But the majority of that is all from uniform cost to, to fund the additional officers that we're requesting. It's approximately four to five thousand dollars to uh, fund for each officer for uniforms in equipment place. So, Chief, I don't know if, you, if you've, in your calculations, if you've done this, if you haven't, it's something we could get another day. But so you have a 13% growth rate in the wages, and you've in, included in that is five officers. Correct. That's, I don't think that's the whole 13, though, right? It's. Yeah, it's both ten of it. And the, the other oh, side, okay. The other so that yeah, that's really what I'm after. Wage so, yeah. so your real wage increases are like three. Correct. Then, no. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's yeah, the actual raises that from uh, the non-union and possibly for the union. We're in negotiations with all three unions. We no, have I right know now. we are. So. so that's where we're at. Yeah. Um, so that, that so that's a bit of a wild card too. But I think it's valuable to know <coughs> to differentiate the two. Yes, sir. Yes, so that you you know you've got some idea that if you were level if you were level without them. You know, you're right in that three percent range. And, you know, would that be relatively true on the expense side too? Yeah, the expenses. We, yeah, yeah exactly. We, we did up about three to four percent. Some of the training right now has gone up in, pr in price for a daily training for an officer. So that's why we've added additional training costs yep. in the membership dues. But the rest of it, the majority of it, is in uniforms. Well, you know, I, the reason I ask that question is, invariably, you know, we're we're asked. Um, not that we necessarily have the answer, but we get asked anyway. Sure. Um, so, what do you mean they're going up 13 percent? Well, in real dollars, they're going up about three. But then we've got the added, the need for the added resources, which, you know. So I think it's sometimes valuable to. I mentioned this last night as well, to differentiate the you know kind of the want from the current status and you know what level really means level really means it's going to cost you three to four percent you're in contract negotiations and everything else so thank you yep all right the patrol division our biggest division and the most visible division <coughs> in the town is the patrol division i uh, like it's right now like i said we have two sergeants and seven patrol officers in days we have 18 officers working nights one lieutenant five sergeants and 12 patrol officers all right So okay, as of well, I'm sorry, as of November 30th, these are our calls for service. We have a, 
approximately 19,000, a little over 19,000 calls for service so far this year. Uh, I just did a calculation a minute ago. If we continue with the same amount that we've had, we'll be over the last previous year's calls for service as of January 1st. Are they driving better, or do we just don't have time to give them tickets? <laughs> <laughs> so we have, actually I looked at that, we were down, it says written citations, we were down last, this current year compared to the last, again, that's without the last month, but also, we, this was with five less offices this past year, we had three in the academy and two retirements, now in one less person uh, uh, because of the budget cuts last year. Right. So. Uh, th uh, three from the academy have just graduated and they're on their own as of October, so now tickets will probably be going up. <laughs> <laughs> so we won't. It's, it's simple math, it's arithmetic. Yeah. <laughs> All right, is the reports filed? These are actual reports that we've written, um, and again, we just looked at the numbers before we got here tonight. We're already over that 1,732 um, so far in the last 13 days. <coughs> So, Chief, an incident report, is that defined as kind of like a crime or, or as opposed to like a call for service? Like it's, it could be it's either. It could be a crime. It, it's kind of a lot of reports, a lot of things are just large entries that we go to a call. An alarm call, for example, check it, the alarm goes off at your house. We walk around the house, check it's secure. There's no report written. It's just a log entry. But if we, if we, you know, for example, your door was, a, you know, a jar, we go in, we have to actually look around and see if there's someone in there find out what's going on. That we have it takes a little more, we have to write a report on that. So just to have a little more documentation on, on it. So that would be a report file. But it could also be um, a domestic disturbance. It could be anything at all just that's that we actually actually write a full report on. All right. Arrests. Our arrests are up so far as of uh, November thirtieth of this year. Complaint apps are well up this past year. A complaint app is an application filed with the court, the summons uh, with the court that someone wasn't arrested usually, but it, but it, it, some were actually taking charges, formal charges out on the person. So that's up. Um, you can see protective custody you know, with drugs and alcohol, that's up. Motor vehicle crashes, it's actually will end up being up. We've already had, we're already over the 528 from two years ago when we checked this, this morning. Um, fraud, calls and theft. That can be credit card calls. A lot of we're getting a lot of complaints from elderly people who, who are getting, you know, scammed. And uh, like we tell them, don't don't talk, just hang the phone up. But, but a lot of them follow through, and sometimes end up having to call us because they end up in a scam. Chief, another this is another example where this is just the view of, of activities or requests or an arrest. But I bet you spend a bit more time on protective custody than you do on an arrest. Or maybe I'm kind of backwards. It, it depends. So, for example, an arrest could be a, uh, a warrant arrest, which could be, end up in and out within 45 minutes to an hour. A protective custody, depending upon what the issue is, we could end up at someone's home, helping them out for a couple of hours and getting someone into a, a placement, into a, you know, outplacement, in placement, uh, helping a family member with a, with, with an, a loved one that has an issue. Um, so, yeah, you're right. It could take a lot more time. That's, we don't really have a way of actually, you know, of, of, of kind of digesting how much time each call takes, except for the actual report times. I don't have a kind of a system of actually right. being able to tell exactly how long each call is. Just curious, because not everything is created equal. Not everything is weighted equally. Yeah. So the bad news is business is up and manpower is down. Correct. We added a lot of calls this year to show you, uh, as well as another call that you know can take anywhere from 10 minutes to a half an hour, 45 minutes. Sometimes we have to wait on a business, we wait around for a um, for the uh, landlord or the uh, superintendent or the custodian to show up, so we can do a, a walk through the schools or walk through the business farm or two. Because <coughs> if we find a door jar and there's no cars here, a lot of times without um, without it's a lot easier to wait for the custodian to get us into the rest of the building. There's certain parts may be locked, but we want to be able to walk through the whole facility. It happened at the high school a couple times this past year, which we actually had breaks. We didn't find the actual break until we get into the school with the custodian. So and that could take four hours. I think that call up there lasted three to four hours by the time we were able to get through the whole school and figure out what exactly had happened up at the high school this past year. Right. Wow. Wow. Overdose, drugs and alcohol 
uh, 35 as of November 30th. Suicide attempts or threats this year is way up. We're at 62. Um, substance involved in alcohol, 187. Substance involved in drugs, 143. This year, we, we started we started last year about halfway through the year collecting opiates as a specific type of call. That may not be an overdose. It will be, it would be an overdose or any time we've had to deal with opioids and all, as well, whether we it's been an arrest where we found opioids on, on a person, we're up to 32 this year. And we decided to start tracking this past year for the first time, mental health related calls, and we had 215. And that's the one where the fire chief mentioned where it, we're up significantly that we decided to keep track of it because some of those calls can last anywhere from 45 minutes to an eight hour shift. You know, we've ended up having an officer with someone to get him into a placement with family members for a full shift, but not longer. And that, that takes, can It's the biggest thing you do, too. Yeah, you right here, yeah, please. So the, the substance involving drugs, that's non-opiates, and then the, the sub-type is with opiates, yeah? Correct. And if you take all the substance issues together, <coughs> it's up and to the right. It, it's, it's exponential growth. Oh. You just take all of those three and sum them together. It's yeah. off the charts. Yeah. That's amazing. <coughs> well, if you put them all together, it makes the mental health not look so bad. Because the other thing is going to shoot. I mean, if you put them all together, they I mean, the, thing, the thing you look for is discontinuities. What's going to break the organization, and what's increasing at a rate beyond the ability of the organization to deal with? I don't know if you have any comments to what to, you know, what, what's the. So, I'm going to give you my my personal view uh, on the, the substance involved in drugs. They've <coughs> they've decriminalized marijuana a couple of years ago, and now they've made it legal from 21 plus. But honestly, we deal with marijuana with kids now in the high school sure. on a daily basis. It, it's they, they, a lot of kids, not all, just feel it's legal and it's okay to do. And we've had a lot of kids overdose on, on small amounts of marijuana because they don't know what they're taking. They're taking, oh, they're taking little, uh, I'm sorry, uh, like look at candy type of marijuana. But we, they don't know this, how, how strong it is or how potent it is. Um, and quite honestly, it's, 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 I won't want to say it's rampant, but there's a significant problem in town with marijuana in you. And it just seems to be, they think it's okay to do. You know, vaping's another, and Erica McNamara will get into it much more in depth than I will. Wow. Well. So I just want to point out on the mental health uh, bill related calls um, and the suicide attempt related calls and the school, another new request from another officer in the schools, that, that does, I assume that dovetails with um, the school's push for social emotional health programs that they have. I, 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 reading a lot of the survey responses, some people didn't really understand the value of the schools getting their social emotional well-being, but this sort of in indicates that that uh, the two go hand in hand. What you're doing, what the schools are doing, sort of ho hopefully will combine to address these issues. Correct. And the school resource officer works um, hand in love with the uh, with the uh, counselors of the high school, uh, including in classroom stuff as well. Yeah. And uh, it's invaluable with what you know trying to get through the kids the best we can. Chief, I, I even hesitate to ask because I don't want to kill you with statistics, but I'd be very interested to know kind of the rate of growth of that circumstance you described, incidents at the school or students that are affected with either the situation you, you talked about or any of the other substances. We, I don't have... Yeah, not today. Yeah, it's okay. Today. Yeah, we could absolutely probably... I'm sure we could, from the school resource officer, we could put that down something for you. Absolutely. No, sure at all. And, and the resource, the second officer into the middle schools is at the plant? Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be obviously prime. It would be primarily, in my opinion, for the middle schools, but uh, all schools. But not limited to them. Correct. Right. You know, we'd love to get back in, as much as we could into the elementary schools. Yes. We end up, you know, we end up with a lot of issues in the elementary schools with kids that are acting out because of things going on at home. You know, right. and then it, it just leads us to figure out where we can put the resources to help parents as best we can from our yep. standpoint. <coughs> So domestic disturbance as of uh, this year is actually up from last year but down from two years ago. Uh, the, so the difference, domestic disturbance is an actual, you, someone calls us because there's an actual fight going on, either verbal, physical, uh, a, a child calls, uh, a, 
a male female calls about their spouse that they're after. There's an actual physical or, or verbal altercation going on. Domestic disturbance is people coming in for advice to the police department or calling about asking questions about how to get a restraining order. Nothing that's ongoing at that specific second, but they're having a problem at home and or you know with or with the, or with the child. It doesn't have to be with the, with the spouse or the students. <coughs> yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, the domestic assistance, that's the difference. The disturbance is when it's going on ongoing right now. The assistance part is when it's actually they have a question about what's going on or you know, or there's an issue at home with someone and they want to know what they can do about it. Sometimes graph two and graph three will eventually might lead to graph one. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, correct. All right. Child custody exchanges, we just put that in this year because just to show you how many we do at the actual the police station, you know, on a yearly basis with families that actually have to come and exchange kids <coughs> right in our, our lobby or out in the parking lot. And uh, this shows you what's really going on in the community. Um, 209A violations, those are restraint order violations, we're actually down this year, which is a good thing. Um, that's the amount we've had, which is actually low, which is good to hear. Chief, the, ch the child ex exchange, is that typically mandated by a document, or is that just as a matter of convenience? It could be both. Sometimes it's mandated by a document, by a court, because of uh, uh, one or the other spouses in fear of what may happen if, right. they, if they exchange at their I home. See. It could be because of a, of, of a court order that's in the in the in the 2098 paperwork. I say they say that you, they want to exchange at a police station. So. Okay, and wanted guest calls, uh, someone calls because either it's a party, someone they've had a party, or or they they just have an issue with a relative or a friend that's over and they want them out and the person won't leave. So that's what I want to guess is threats, harassing calls, um, suspicious person that. calls, uh, suspicious motor vehicle calls. That's just someone calls because they see something going on in the neighborhood, they're not sure what it is and they decide to give us a call. Um, so again, this is all information we want to really get down to so we can show you what we're doing on a daily basis. Uh, child neglect or abuse, 51 A's is a, is a term used for um, when we file paperwork with DCF, Department of Child and Children and Families. 258 E's are civil harassment orders, whereas if uh, you have an issue with your neighbor, you've been harassed by or, or a friend and not a, someone you're related to by blood or marriage, you can get a 258 E order. Welfare person checks. Uh, that's that. Those are, again, Calls where someone calls about they can't get in touch with someone, they're not sure you know where the person is. Uh, again, it can last from five minutes to three hours, depending upon the call, what's going on. Uh, some of those have had some of those staff that have ended up in, in uh, sudden death calls because they can't get in touch with someone for a couple days, and we end up finding someone when we get to the house. It's had it's, it's been domestic issues. It could be a variety of things with that with that call code right there. Uh, missing person, adult, juvenile. That's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> Chief, are welfare checks, um, is that mostly um, elderly? I would say the majority are probably elderly, but it could be it could be any age. We've had a lot of times it could be, a, a, quite honestly, it could be a, a, a family member who just doesn't want to speak to another family member and they won't answer the phone and all of a sudden we <laughs> end up there, you know, listen, can you call your mother and just let her know you're fine, you know, or we'll let them know you're fine for you, but that's, you know, you know and hopefully that's what all it is, you know, but you never know until you get there. So, so you guys are in loco parentis more often than not. Say, I'm sorry? You guys are the local parent more often than not. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so state and federal crime reporting, it's, it's called NIBRS, uh, National Tip Based Reporting. Uh, they, some of our code, we, all of our calls are coded. Yeah, I just wanted to show you, it's considered in the federal, in the, with the state, with the feds, part one crimes. And these are basically some of our calls we showed you above. We actually have more calls than to show you. They look like we have more of the town of Reading than the feds. The feds have, you have to be at a significant level, say money-wise, for for vandalism I see. or a robbery before they consider it a, a crime in their in their terms. So I just wanted to show you. This kind of just shows you where we're at with the feds. What what is the level for a burglary? That, that's 200. 200 and uh, 250. 250, yeah, 250 dollars. Okay. Yeah. Same thing with vandalism. So we would take a report on all vandalism calls and investigate it. The federal government only wants to report over $250 charge. 
again, the majority we are, are, are getting up to this year. Is this data on the web, Chief? For sure. It, not, it will be. We, I wanted to bring this here tonight first before we put it up. Yeah. Um, we don't have a program that does it automatically. This is all done. Yeah, it's well, sorry. It's we painful. do it automatically, but it's not something we just upload automatically. Right, it's painful. Pornography, that's specifically child pornography type of issues we've got to deal with. Uh, sexual offenses, there's just a appears to show you. We had, there is it. Rape, sexual assaults, those could be. Uh, actually, it could be ongoing. Majority of someone that comes in later on after something happened, you know, and again, those type of calls can be 40 to 60 hours of investigation to go in um, to each one. You know, one of our detectives, Michelle Howard, is a specialist in sexual assault investigations, and she spent hours upon hours interviewing people in court, out of court, uh, with the DA's office. They uh, they have to, they do what's called the same interview, sexual assault interview with uh, victims, which can last, you know. Four to six hours just to get to itself, then you have to go back and write up all your notes, the whole investigation. Chief, did that one really go from zero to 11, or is it, it wasn't reported before? Was it yeah, it's, so we have what happened was this past year we have a different coding to specifically now to use for that and, that, and that's why it looks like 11. I think we probably had two or three last year. We had three last year, yeah, yeah. three last year. But it's just we have new coding now this year with a new company that we've kind of been. But, we took two companies, we merged them together this past year, Microsystems in what's called DataViz, and it's made, it's, it's fine-tuned a better uh, report than we've kind of been able to put out in the past. So were there two that's the last year in 11 this week? Correct. All right, the detective division. That's just giving us a basic overview of what of the detective division about now to the reports themselves. <coughs> So this year, we're up to, actually, I checked with the detective lieutenant before we got here. We're at 152 so far as of the last 13 days. So we are up above last year, but this was as of November 30th. Basically, any call in the department uh, to, that goes beyond the patrol division, in other words, if an arrest is not made, a report not taken that doesn't go any further, the detective follow up on. Um, we have two general detectives during the day. We have one that does, pro another one that does prosecuting during the day always over court and then we have um, one night detective who works uh, every night of the week Monday to Friday and um, basically we follow up on or you know try to get our own uh, more cases with drugs or more cases with other issues that are coming up that, that didn't fall into the patrol, hands of patrol um, these are cases that it says 141 these are cases that usually can be anywhere from a day to weeks of, of investigation time that goes into each of these each of these cases. Um, it, the numbers may look low, but when it comes to the actual time that goes into these, it's, it's unbelievable. Because I worked for eight and a half years in detectives, and it's definitely one of the more you have the serious parts of the job that you really need to follow up and do your, uh, really dot your eyes and crush your teeth throughout for court. Because with all, almost every one of these cases is up in a court. Uh, it's more important yeah, if the case comes up during the day requiring detective work for the day, the daytime, do they hand that off to the nighttime guy, or do they continue on an overtime basis? It depends upon the case. If it so, if a patrol so a patrol officer goes to a burglary, yeah. uh, initially, you know, and they get some evidence, detectives are called over, called into the burglary, they do their thing, find out, you know, they're looking for whatever type of evidence specifically. For example, we had a case we just solved through DNA. Uh, from a burglary on Wogan Street several years ago that finally came back. The perpetrator left a, a cigarette butt on the front stairs. Well, so the detective gets there, says to the to the owner of the home, smoke? I don't smoke. Anyone, anyone you know, your house? Nope. Grab that. Ends up being someone had broken into a house in a different part of town, but it took us almost six years through DNA to get to get the person in to actual to actually you know investigate it more person admitted to it. So, you know, you never know what you're gonna you know, what you're gonna find. The person could come up with a reason they were in that person's steps six years ago, you know. <laughs> so not to smoke. Support services. Support services the safety officer. The safety officer is involved on a daily basis with town hall, 
for a lot of issues when it comes to the de design review team. We, they spoke about yesterday in uh, in uh, G. Dallas's uh, <coughs> forum. Also um, involved heavily with the DPW with signage, road signage. Uh, also, if anyone calls or complains about speed, parking problems, or anything else, that the safety officer is, is directly involved on a daily basis. Uh, the armor, the armored fleet maintenance officer. That person takes care of all of our firearms, make sure we're training firearms, all of our maintenance of our all of our cruisers to make sure that they're uh, up to up to speed. <coughs> all the equipment that we have for the cruisers to make sure in in our um, equipment for our uh, firearms to make sure everything's where it has to be. Um, and then the, the last person up there that is the community service officer. And that's a position that two years ago. We had a different person doing it, but they were working on a shift doing it. And it just, to me, when I became chief, I had talked to the town manager. It wasn't working the way I wanted it to be. So currently, the community service officer, as you've seen, she's very visible. We've, we're very. big on the Facebook. We're big on the Twitter. We're big on the coffees with the cop. She runs the RAD program. She runs the Citizens Police Academy. These are things that kind of fallen by the wayside that I brought back myself to the department uh, in the last couple of years and I, I really strongly believe in it and I'm, you know, I think people know I'm out there in the open myself on a daily basis and I think it's it's an invaluable part of the building trust and the capacity of the department with the community. I, I, I think she's, that's an invaluable position to have, you know, and I, I fought for that one to get her, to get her off, of the patrol, uh, off the patrol schedule and do it as a specific uh, uh, position which has been, I think, I believe very successful for the department. Mm -hmm. uh, the pocket officer, so that's some of the revenue generated the last time we had the pocket, the pocket officer. Okay. All right. Any questions about I police? I have two for you, Chief. Sure. Um, you. Your department gets pulled in in some of the most um, challenging human circumstances there are. You've got children, you've got adults in a variety of states of dispute. Um, is, there a, is there a compensatory element to the budget in terms of, I, I couldn't do that work. <laughs> Just the emotional part of it, would I, I couldn't deal with it. I, is there a compensatory part to how the budget deals with, you know, letting the guys wind down and kind of get it out of their system, or is it just part of the work and it doesn't bother them? I, I think it's just part of the work. I'd say it definitely bothers people. I think it, this is the, the one thing we've had over the last probably year now to year and a half is we've definitely gotten busier, and sometimes you go in at the end and you have a little more downtime on shifts. You yep. don't have it as much as we did, especially days in, in Florida. So we work. It's basically three shifts, midnight to eight, which are called last house, the day shift, and then what's called the first half, which is the four, four to midnight shift. Days of the four to midnight are definitely the, the busiest shifts in the department. Um, although, if a serious call comes in on a midnight shift, you know it's a pretty serious call. That's the other thing we have had, obviously happens, but but sometimes these officers are out straight, you know, for the amount that we have working the shifts sometimes on the road. And I definitely notice when you speak to these officers, the downtime is not there like it used to be right. years ago. And it definitely, you it takes some time. I mean, you can't just go home at the end of a shift and, and, and unwind as easily as you could 10 years ago. Uh, and then the last question is in the Sanborn Street fire. I was there for about five hours that day, and I remember hearing that, uh, although it's an extreme circumstance, things like um, some of the battery-operated equipment you were running out of, it, um, <coughs> charge you couldn't get back to the fact to the headquarters because everyone's deployed is your expense budget covering some of the upgrades that you think you need for kind of extreme circumstances is that already built in here as well yeah no it is and we've also actually in the last few weeks actually we just we just purchased about 11 more batteries to be honest with you for our portables because in to have more out in the road the problem is that you don't know when you go out there how long you're going to be and exactly. you try to get them out like that day we ended up finally getting someone back to the station to get more batteries and get them out to us because it just, you know, it was just the manpower. First, we needed everybody out there, and then we found that we were able to get four additional departments around Woburn, Woburn's North Reading, Stoneham, and Wakefield had come out that day to help us and assist the mutual aid. And uh, once they came, we were able to relieve some of our officers that were on post from traffic issues. We were able to, to kind of be able to redeploy and get more help out to where we needed it. We had more equipment to where we needed it at that point. And the last question, do you s can you speak to any new technology requirements this year that either extend the reach of the force 
make their work easier or make make the work is there any particular technology investment that you want to highlight or it's fine to say no I'm just curious no it's okay um, I'm actually we're talking to the unions right now um, Tom manager about tasers we're one of only three departments in the area that do not have tasers perfect example and it's just an, another tool on our belt yeah. to have like anything else you don't it's it's a it's a um, a non lethal non lethal weapon and we'd like to have it it's an additional tool for us that if we deal with someone that you know we don't have to go put, with the uh, with the force we would like to have, and that's just something else we're talking with the unions with right now. What, um, would, what would you think the cost of that, if it were just budgetary numbers? You're about six thousand dollars for a, a taser. We're looking to get probably a half dozen. I'd like to have one to two out <coughs> shift. You don't have to have every officer that I can see with one, but we'd like to have one or two out there per shift. That if we have we need it, they're available. Uh, but we would train probably every officer in the use of them, which is an eight-hour training initially up front. And, and your armorer would take care of it, and there's a maintenance aspect to it, and I'm sure it's more than around to, re to recharge it. So. Yes, you're right, correct. Okay. Uh, but that's probably uh, I know we've, the town manager and I have been talking recently about the dispatch center and, and some of the equipment, and, and we may need to, to be redoing that. And I'm thinking about bringing it up. Uh, closer than we were thinking anticipated in the past, but that's about the only additional equipment that we see coming up. Is that in here? Any of the, is that last ask? That, that, would, be no, capital. that would be um, that would be capital, a capital spend, of course. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chief. I, I should have asked the fire chief this question as well. I just didn't think that. Um, but feel free to chime in. Um, to to get the additional five at these five officers, um, we're more than likely we need some sort of override. Um, and so, could you speak to, and I'm not asking you to use scare tactics or anything like that, but speak to what Town of Reading would not get if we don't get these extra officers or what they will, will get, maybe just a little more positive uh, spin on it, um, with these five additional officers so people can sort of understand what, what's at stake and what they're voting for. Sure. So what you'll get is more coverage on the street for patrol. That's 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 the major and, and the school and an additional school resource officer for the schools. But the biggest part that we see come out of it is more coverage on the street on a, on, a, on a daily basis that we that we do use. You know, and that's where we see the beat right now. We the, the help is on the actual street on a daily basis, and that would help us get to where we need to be. We just grown. We've grown so much in the last ten years, and we haven't grown the police department in size, and that's. That's an issue. I mean, just the population of the town has grown significantly, and the, uh, the police department has it. But in, in terms of officers, and that's what we could really use to help us use on the street on a daily basis. It sounds like you'll also um, have police officers that are slightly less stressed. Oh, absolutely. And it, 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 absolutely. It, it's a different generation now, too. I mean, like we've talked about the millennials, it's just a different world. When I started, <laughs> you worked every yeah, yeah, yeah. You worked every detail and overtime you could yeah. to save money. But this, the kids nowadays that are coming on, it's just they don't they they, they value the time off, and it's just a different way of <coughs> thinking than it. I put it this way: we had to order people this year on four different days to work details, not even overtime, because we had certain projects going on in the town that we had to cover with offices that just public safety wise, I had to have lieutenants order these people into work. Because there were certain projects going on that we needed coverage for, that, that just to help the traffic control. Period. You know, and that's never happened in the history of the Reading Police Department. So that happened, and I take that very seriously. That I don't have to order people in the day off to come to work, but quite honestly, we do what we have to do to maintain uh, uh, the coverage for the town. We have to. The first thing is we have to protect this town, whether it's during traffic or whether it's on shifts and assignments of minimal staffing. We have to have a certain amount of people in there. And we try hiring overtime voluntarily, but if people don't want to come in, they are got to come in one way or the other. Yeah. And Chief, Chief Burtz, yeah. did you, I'm sorry, I, I wanted you to answer, answer the same same question because I'm sure have asked it of you. Sure, for us it would be um, it would be reduction in the overtime, and it would also be less stress on the um, on the firefighters as well. And one of the things that we're seeing is um, because the overtime level is is what it is that we're holding people over. We don't order them in, but we don't let them go home either. So, <laughs> a little, it's, it's, it's a different approach, but achieves the same thing, unfortunately. And, th and that's a big impact to the, to the firefighters. Um, 
because you know they had plans they have family they might have to take care of them but you know we can't let them go you know we we need them for that for that staffing level so um, we've seen that increase this past year even even last year but that's on the increase and and, and I like to see that go the other way because it, it is a uh, impact on morale when somebody gets held it's a, it's a real it's a real negative impact I, mean, I did notice that that your estimated guesstimate of the savings in overtime goes uh, a significant way to offsetting the cost of the additional salary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I'm, I'm just going to say real quick, I, I'm sorry I don't have my staff of study with me. Actually, I have my copy here for that. I don't have it for the screen. That I can well, we, it we've seen it. Yeah, right. we, we, we have, have it. it. Okay, I was going to say, because one thing I will say to the, to the fire chief had mentioned was, out of the 22 comparable towns, population-wise, as of 2015, uh, Reading was was uh, below average with 1.66 officers currently, where the average is 1.8 from the uh, the 22 to the towns that we have. I just don't have it up on the screen. And for those watching at home, and I'll thank Bill Brown for this. In 1967, with a town population of, and I'm going from memory here, 20. Six, I think it was 16. Yeah, same number. Of we had a force that was identically equal, to police force, identically equal to the same size we have today. And that, I understand technology makes up some of that, cars make up some of that, um, but you don't make it all up on, on that. And that's just an amazing statistic that we've, we've added to the town 40% and we haven't touched our, our police headcount. It's amazing. Yeah. The, the thing that's kind of different about public safety than some of the other departments that we heard earlier um, if you don't get your five officers or your four firefighters, um, when people dial 911, you're still going to come. The service is not going to go away. If Amy can't hire another librarian, there's certain programs she can't do. If Jean can't hire another planner, there's certain things that are not going to get done. You're still going to get everything <coughs> done. But the, the difference is, is that's going to get done at a significant emotional cost. Um, different time costs. You're not going to be able to attribute the fact that something bad happens because, oh, we didn't have that extra officer. You're still going to get it, you're still going to cover it, and you're still going to get it done. It's just that um, uh, there are other costs that are, that are associated with that that the public won't see. So, you know, there's a cost of doing nothing. And as much as there is a cost, obviously, of adding the officers to, you know, for, for coverage. And that's for not a small cost either, the no. cost of doing nothing. But that's also a cost that you can't quantify. Some people, like oh. you, you read the survey, people say, well, I want to see what I'm going to get for that. Well, you know, you're not going to, you, you just can't quantify it in dollars and cents per se, right, um, about having one more officer or one less firefighter, right, because the service is still going to happen. But I, I think um, you could probably quantify it in terms of response time if there were multiple right. ongoing incidents well, at the same time. Right. I think intuitively, you know, when you talk about, you know, what you show a voter for what they're, what they get for what they're spending, um, and I think that this is, a, frankly, I think it's a mistake that we made last time, and we and we knew it too late. That you know, we know what an officer costs, we know what a firefighter costs. I mean, we can quantify that. You know, I, I, I go back to my favorite thing I always say. It's just arithmetic, you know. I mean, you take a piece of paper and you write down how much it costs. And you say to a voter, um, if you got one more police officer, one more firefighter, and that represented a permanent tax increase of $12, you'd say, oh, okay, maybe that's not so bad because intuitively they know what all of you and your teams do I mean in, in look we could put all the bar graphs in the world up we know what you do you keep us safe you know you make sure that you know when somebody's hurt they get a response and they get a you know a first-rate response those are the things you guys deliver all the time I think it becomes incumbent on us I, in my opinion you guys have made a clear case for just with the statistics for what needs to be done and it becomes incumbent on us to demonstrate what that's going to cost and what that means to the average taxpayer and figure out how to do it and figure out how to do it i, I will say one thing we're, 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 
some of the things you may not get is the proactive stuff if we don't continue to grow because we're just right. getting with the, the amount of calls that are coming in for service. The proactive things we do like traffic force. So we have people calling every day about speeding on their, their roads or uh, stop signs. But we're just not going to have the time to sit and watch like we would, or we haven't had Correct. the time like we have in the past with the cost of service because our yeah. You cost. know what? I'll tell you, people. That's a really important thing to say. I mean, we're all monitoring. I mean, I, I'm sure everybody up here is busy monitoring six or seven um, <coughs> social media sites where various people gather. That's one of the things they, they're not happy about. I mean, among a lot of things that people aren't happy about, but, you know, one of the things is they're driving too fast. They're not in behaving themselves courteously with their vehicles when they're dropping kids off at school. I mean, and these are things that by not doing what we haven't done, that's how you quantify the absence of you guys being present. And that really does matter. You know, it, it, it's real. Questions? George. Sorry to make you get right. up. Uh, George Katchen. I'd like to pick up on the proactive because you take the school resource <coughs> officer, they're being reactive now, or the <coughs> single person reactive, and can't get in there and do training and help on drug issues and have the special sessions for the students. I think that type of thing is what we miss. Yeah, I, I will say this. We've had, I've had several chiefs say, say to us they can't, ima can't believe the amount of calls we deal with in the schools in the town of Rang with one person. It's just, you know, they actually say our, our officers that do it are pretty amazing people because we have one person and they are going out straight from 7 in the morning until 3 in the afternoon. And then there's always a 2.45 on a Friday. <laughs> one principal calls about something and that person's here till 6, 7 o'clock at night on a Friday afternoon. And yeah. that's how it is. And they're good and they're fine. But that just, just happens all the time. Well, the interesting thing about your bar graphs is you look at the things that are related to the schools. And, you know, we know a lot of the drug issues, a lot of the, you know, alcohol issues. Now, they're not all, you know, juveniles. Correct. But, but there's a lot of them. Um, and, you know, one of the things you're trying to help mitigate is that early onset. Um, the, you know, the next resource officer makes a difference. Right. And if it's not the kid themselves, a lot of times it could be a parent that has an issue. Exactly. Like, and then we end up with dealing with the kids at school on a disciplinary issue that kind of stems from what's going on at home. Chief, you said earlier, and I, it's worth repeating, that um, certain votes that occurred at the state level appear to have little or no local impact. But in fact, you see the impact here. You talked earlier about the legalization of marijuana in some towns across the state, but, <coughs> but for commercial sale in some towns. There's a very measurable cost to youth and it's being borne here by you gentlemen intervening to try to save somebody or talk to somebody or put them back on the right path. That's really hard to explain to people that a decision made three years ago shows up as a, ri a change in number of incidences. You've done a great job to present that here, and we need to remind people that that's well, a cost. And the other interesting thing that you brought up, and I think this is really important, and that is that you talked about how you guys are anecdotally experiencing kids with higher use of marijuana uh, it's legal why why can't I you know my parents are um, I, it, I mean that's real and all you have to do is understand that that's a real thing that's happening because you guys live with it and then go back to the meeting that was had so poorly attended in September honestly I, I mean I the message that came in that ARCASA meeting about the impact um, to the juvenile brain of all of these substances, <laughs> we, we need more people to understand that. You're telling us it's happening and, you know, we had experts backing up, you know, the, the problem. And the problem is very serious. Um, yeah, there are any other questions from the audience? Yes. Come on up and use the mic. We have this is a very quiet room. Hi, Linda Phillips. Um, as a town meeting member, one of the concerns I hear a lot is in your study for staffing, do you ever um, or how have you considered the impact on flags 
uh, I mean, uh, having an officer at a site for traffic control. <coughs> have you ever looked at other ways and means? Similar to you have crossing guards from regular people and they're trained in the community and it's a part-time job. Is there any, have you ever looked into having part-time people work in traffic detail so that the overtime would be reduced and it would give some other people another job at less than what it costs to have an officer? So, if I want to keep my current job, I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's going to be a big union issue, quite honestly. Oh, that's what okay. that comes down to. That's an all negotiated thing between both both unions, uh, both bargaining units, of the patrol offices and the, the super superior offices in town. Uh, and quite honestly, it's Massachusetts. The way the laws are set up, the only flagman that were able to be used were through the state, and that fizzled out probably a couple of years ago. Now, yeah, it didn't last. So Governor Deval Patrick had brought it in at one point. We saw our committee ready for about a day, <laughs> and then that was it. And then it's just the rules that they put in this, the place were, were, were they, they had to come and give the, the police chief a proposed plan every day of what they were going to do with flag, absolutely. And I think, quite honestly, um, I just don't see it happening like you, you want it to happen. Because so like the power companies used to have their own people do it, but they, now it's all the no, they, they never did have their own people do it. Oh, they, okay. the, the state tried to do it a couple of years ago, well, several years ago now, and it kind of fizzled quick. I, I, with, I think, and I don't want to speak out of turn, but I think with, uh, with the way these st state is set up with, um, with how they pay their, uh, their, their own the flag prices were getting up to be a, that's a state as expensive it was to be a police officer. So you get a trained professional compared to someone just waving a flag, quite honestly, out there in our opinion, you know. Well, that, that helps me explain that when someone brings it up. Tell me, yeah, I just want to add to that. Um, it's actually not a lot of money in the Reading General Fund Police Department budget to pay for that. That's much more utilities. We pay as customers for the utility, but not as taxpayers, okay. just to make that distinction. Okay. It, it's in other budgets, like the DPW has a couple of line items for details. So, okay. you know, 12 grand here, 10 grand there. Okay. So that, that's real. Oh, okay. But it's that's mostly the utility companies. They are the private companies. That but you're still yeah. that that's good to know. Um, the second question is, I was on town meeting the first year we put the resource officer in high school, and at the time it was presented, it was a joint partnership with the schools, and I'm sure it still is how they work together. Um, also at the time, they were, um, the school paid for, the hours they put in at school and the vacation time the schools are closed in the summertime the officers did regular officer work is that still the practice do you get um, I don't see it in the school department budget that they're paying for a resource officer and is that kind of like just been decided forever or is that something that you can talk about that maybe they pick up some of the charges for that especially when we want to add another one Maybe so, so since I've been here, I, the police department has always picked up the, the school resource officer budget. Um, prior to myself, I can't, I don't know how it went back. I think it started from 2005, 2007. So, uh, so, yeah. so I think what happened, Linda, because I, I, I wasn't at, at town, <coughs> town meeting at that time, too, and there was a there was a grant, and it was a grant that might have come as a result of requests through the school department, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I think the first one to maybe even three years, I mean, there was a... 35, 50, Yes, 25. it kept going yeah, down. It was, yeah. Because I do remember, frankly, at town meeting, when it was time for the town to, you know, appropriate the money, believe it or not, there were people that went, we shouldn't have that, we should lay that guy off. I mean, I remember the... I was incredulous at the conversation, to be honest with you. Um, but... So I think what happened was there was a school, there was a grant that came through the, through the, you know, the efforts of the school department. It wasn't really in their budget. I think yeah, it was, I think, a, I think it was a grant, and I think it was a sliding grant, knowing that ultimately we'd have to, Pick it up. we'd have to absorb it, of course. So, and so then, do on um, vacations in summer, the officer becomes. So, we hoped this is what happened though because the officer has to work so much for that nine or 10 months that school's going on. And actually, you start in August, because training start in August, basically, for the following year. So it's basically <coughs> 10 plus months, 10 and a half months. The only time that person really has time to take off 
is, is basically July. Okay. So that's the thing. I mean, which is yeah. just the way it is. I mean, they're kind of like a teacher that way that they need yeah. they need to be able to use the vacation time. Yeah. And I limit it extremely like during the school year. It's, it's you know if it's not a vacation that the you know, kids are off, unless they would get married, they pretty much are working. You know, so that's basically how it works. Thank you so much. On a personal note, I'd like to thank you all for what you do. But uh, I have. I'm interested in um, my new uh, RCTV show, Hello Reading, and the town manager has kind of volunteered you guys to participate in the time, <laughs> and I'd love to schedule that <laughs> with you. Tell you. But, um, <laughs> yeah, we are talking all day, so give us a call. What I'm, what I'm, it's going to be based on your performance review. Uh, but one of, one of um, your representatives, Mr. Halsey and Mr. Ensminger, did speak to public safety, and they did share some of the information you had tonight. So it's uh, actually section um, section uh, show four, and uh, so you can go on YouTube and look up Hello Reading, and on section four they talk about public safety to to what you have tonight. But it would be it would be really nice to have you guys come and speak too, and we can do that sometime after the holiday. Give us a call. I will. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Ann Landry from FinCom, thank you, Chiefs, for the presentation. I heard you say that there isn't any downtime on the job to unwind and process what's happening. Um, so I was just wondering if there are any mental health supports or resources that you refer officers to to help them um, process secondary <coughs> trauma from the job. Sure, so, so I don't want to be, be specific. I don't want to say there's no downtime, but it's not, it's not yeah, definitely limited sure, downtime. Sure. Uh, but We've learned there's the EAP through the Talent Employee Assistance Program, which if an officer is having any issues at all, we would definitely refer the person to. But we also deal with peer um, peer um, review as well, meaning that we have several officers out of the department in other departments that are really good at coming in when we've had either a major incident, a trauma incident, or, uh, or um, that someone's just having something going on at home, a crisis at home, that we can, we can refer them to as well. Police are a unique group, and I think fire is probably the same. They, they really like talking sometimes to their own people, and we have actual officers, one in our own department, many in, around, including Boston and the State Police, who actually have a complete unit set up to help all our other officers as well for peer uh, crisis intervention. And um, we've actually had to, had to use them in the past, and it's, it's completely voluntary on the officer's part, but it's something that's very uh, private, and you know, they can go and kind of talk to people and you know and kind of go from there for whatever we do, anything we can do for the person world. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the public? Thank you, Chief. Are we going to dispatch? Sure. All right. <coughs> okay, dispatch. Um, it's up five point four percent in wages. It's the same staffing as the current year. Which is, I'm sorry, it's 10 full time dispatches and one super dispatch supervisor that the uh, that staffing level shows. Wages are up 5.9%. Um, there's our luggage. Dispatches make luggage for every single call that we deal with. Um, so, this is where we are so far this year, up to 32,000 calls for service. I'm sorry, luggage. Um, there's our stickets for this past year so far. I mean, Access that you do so for the town. That was as a that was prior to the to the hundred and fifty dollar ones that, that stopped on November thirtieth for these right here. Oh, okay. So these special is kind of a unique group. They they answer anyone that comes into the police station uh, twenty four hours a day will be um, <coughs> will be uh, met by a dispatcher. They, they basically are our forefront of our eyes and ears when it comes to the uh, communicating with the public on a, at the police station. So we probably have between 50 and 100 people a day come into the police station looking for either an access sticker uh, to make a, a license to carry, which is a license to carry firearm appointment to, to meet with a detective for directions for a medical emergency, for a domestic issue. Uh, we've had, quite honestly, we've had happened in the past we've had people chased right into the police station on a road rage, road rage incident um, matter of fact that only happened a couple weeks ago on a, on a on a foot of 12 shift where a woman ran into the station when a guy 
tragedy right behind him. So, they, the, 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 uh, welcome to Melbourne. Well. So, it's, 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 you, you name it, we've seen it. But this batch is, yeah, they're at they're the forefront when you walk into the police station. They're, they really have a, the, the job has become so much more technical than it ever was <coughs> with computers and with everything else. It's just, um, they do an amazing job. I can't speak highly, any more highly about them than they do. And the dispatch officers are armed, right? They're, they're no, they're not armed. They're complete civilians. And they're in a uniform, but they're not armed. I see. Thank you. And they deal not just with the police. It's the fire, it's the 911. It, it, it's, it's, it's a very involved job. Any questions about dispatch? And it's kind of shown up on our public record request. Um, I just wanted to put a little respect on how that has grown so much in the last year is in the amount of work we have to put in to gather public records for people. And before you leave, it. before you leave the uh, the dispatch, what, what was I know you mentioned it a little bit earlier this evening. What's our real equipment situation there? So we've had the same equipment. You know, it's been upgraded. Don't get me wrong, but we've yeah. had the basic same equipment since the police station. Well, I know there's software upgrades, and you know, <laughs> a lot of. You know, uh, so yeah, so we bought here. <coughs> some of the cabinetry in the in the dispatch, most of the cabinetry was actually what we used back when the police station was built back in 2000, yeah. 99, 2000. It, it's it's, and I think uh, IT is gone. I don't see Kevin in the room anymore. But we had a, we actually had a meeting about it today. It's a need for an upgrade. Uh, it's yeah. getting significant. By like cabinetry, you mean the electronics and the radio switching and all of that? Correct. We took the tin cans down. Right. <laughs> we just, no, this still the strength still yeah. yeah. Strength Kevin's there. But Kevin's, uh, after speaking with Kevin at a meeting this afternoon, he just can't get any more wires into the into the dispatch center as, as is. And it's just the, the way technology is growing, that it's just not working out the way we'd like it to. Well, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago. Um, um, when you had Dave's job, uh, you and Jim were in to talk to us. Um, I want to say, you know, maybe six months. It was it was Jim's last real or visit uh, to talk yeah. to us about about this, and it was in the fall. It was I think. the warning, and it was a there was it, it was a warning about that exact thing. So this is not news, um, and I, I clearly understand that. You've got manpower issues, you know, over equipment issues. The equipment seems to be working, but I, and then again, that would be capital. That's not going to be, you know, out of a budget. I guess, right, Bob? Yeah. Yeah, I'll I'll speak to it a little. The superintendent, myself, the facilities director, have met on this behind the police chief's back, right, and discussed the security issue, right, um, which you all know about. And redoing the dispatch center really is part of that process. Yeah. Okay. So as we discussed it, and as John will come in and describe next week as just a small piece of it, it made a great deal more sense for us to begin the whole process by addressing the dispatch center rather than doing some other things and fitting equipment in there and then someday say, right. oh, let's right. rearrange the yep. dispatch Okay, so it's already comprehended okay, in that so work. Today, a number of us actually walked around the entire police station to understand operationally how it works, because I don't know all the details. And, um, really try to think about what can we build where and what makes the most sense who works together the most um, so you know forgetting who what is there now just what makes the most sense and I don't it, it takes some time for us to sort this out but you know the dispatch equipment you know, 20 to 25 year old years old is kind of remarkable yeah the equipment's older than some of the police state <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's using it. and it's, it's in the capital plan, so I can go into more detail yeah okay Thank you very much. Any questions before we go? Yes. I just had one comment. I believe that we have um, officers in dispatch 24 hours a day. We have dispatchers in dispatch. In dis dispatchers, yeah. sorry. So I just wanted to say I was in a neighboring community on like a Saturday morning and I walked in and I'm like, there's no one here. <laughs> and you had to pick up a phone and talk to someone and it was so unsettling to me. And so I think it's such a priority that yep. we have people in that room and that situation with the woman running from a guy chasing her from road rage. <coughs> like, you're going to pick up the phone? Right. You know, there's a person right there that, that can see the urgency of that situation. So I just wanted to say that I appreciated it. I was just completely confused without someone 
I'll tell you the truth. I was over there recently myself, and I know what you're talking about. Oh, okay. I didn't know what you to do when I got there. I had the picture photo. The community that will have your name next door. Yeah, so, um, anyway. no, thank you. I completely understand that. Thank you. Well, I, I can go you one better. I'm having breakfast tomorrow with this fellow, but I'm going down to Crescent Community. There's a cell phone not home. far from us that closes on the weekends. The police station. He knows. He, got, he knows who it is. There's still officers driving around in cars, but there's no one in the police station. There's no one at all. Think about that. Well, Chief, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Chief Thanks to all of you. Thank you all. We'll take a few seconds here to get some circulation in our, our uh, seats and clear the room. Eric, you want to take it away? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. You're on. Oh, I'm on. Okay. <coughs> Erica McNamara, the director of the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse. Thanks so much. I know it's, it's getting late, so I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, I'm just here to talk a little bit about what our CASA does, um, how we work with our police department, our town, and our schools, as well as our librarians and all of our different town staff. We have a lot of different partnerships that make uh, up the coalition itself. Um, we are currently grant funded. I'll talk a little bit about that and then talk about what it means when the grant funding um, is completed. Um, so our history, we were actually um, a coalition that was created at the urgency of our local residents and citizens. Um, there was an investig investigatory committee that was put together by the selectmen, and we were actually formed as an organization in 2006. We chose to partner with the town, so we have a memorandum of understanding that allows us to operate within the confines of the police department with our fiscal agent as the town of Reading, and then we have a number of different program partnerships with the schools and other um, town entities. Um, our goals are really pretty simple, to establish and strengthen local collaboration around the issue of substance use and abuse, um, and really to increase local efforts to support um, and reduce the onset of youth substance use so that we can delay or avoid young people developing the disease of addiction later in life. Um, our leadership, basically, um, there is a board of directors that meets on a monthly basis. We have 26 members that represent a lot of different segments of the community. There's 12 specific sectors that we have to have on board. Those include faith leaders, town liaisons like our selectmen, our town manager, police chief, um, as well as parents, people who have experience in the issue of substance use, as well as prevention folks, people who work with recreation, our school committee. Um, and then we have lay people who are um, citizens or residents who have an interest or uh, want to support what we're doing. We have two people who are part of our board of directors. Um, we have Pat Shannon, who's our president, who's here, as well as Elaine Webb, our vice president. They're, they represent the coalition as parents. And then we also have Sherry Vandenacker, who's a president, uh, parent representative as well. And they really represent the, in the interests of um, whatever age their, their child is at. And that information is very helpful because kids need different things at different developmental levels. Um, we also have a number of regional collaborations. We work with the Mystic Valley Public Health Coalition. That is Medford, Malden, Melrose, Wakefield, Reading, Stoneham, and Winchester. We get enormous amount of resources through that partnership. We meet on a monthly basis, sometimes more than monthly. We put together a lot, a lot of larger projects. Um, one project is our bathroom safety project 
which educates people on uh, public restroom safety related to overdoses. In Reading and around our surrounding communities, there's been a number of overdoses in public restrooms. We've had 22 restroom incidents in Reading um, involving overdoses where a person goes down. And so it's very important for people who work in those businesses to know what's safe, how to, how to react, how to handle it. What, you know, calling 911, of course, and getting making sure that fire is there to administer Narcan, but also not to touch the trash, not to touch um, things around the person because we don't want someone to get exposed either to sharks or also to um, some of the materials such as fentanyl, which can be absorbed through the skin. That 22 is this year? Not this year. That's overtime. Um, so we, we've looked at overdoses and then looked at what locations they've occurred in. Large amount of over overdoses occur in residences, but we've had a, we've also had a number occur in public restrooms, um, gas stations, convenience centers, Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks, wow. all those places. And that is mirrored across our other seven communities that we work with. They're in the same boat as us. So together we put together a bathroom safety program and um, we have uh, been doing education around the region around that. We also work with the Eastern Middlesex District Attorney's Opioid Task Force. That's a monthly group. Um, it's, it's much larger than the seven communities. I believe there's about 26 communities represented. Um, we're pooling resources, trying to strategize around the issue, not just of opioids. I mean, we are in the midst of an epidemic. It's not an opioid epidemic, it's an addiction epidemic. So it's much bigger than just opioids, and it affects people beyond the person who's using it. It affects the grandparents that are now raising children. It affects babies being substance, babies being born substance exposed. It affects children who are exposed to a parent's overdose. So it's very far reaching. And it requires all the public resources that you just saw from our police and our fire <laughs> in terms of medical responses. Not to mention the emotional support that families need um, in experiencing what's happening with a family member. And then we also work with our regional police risk assessment team, which involves Woburn and Winchester uh, and some of their, their hospital resources. <coughs> Um, our funding history, we've um, raised a lot of funding through our grants. Um, we've been pretty successful with that, about one and a half million in terms of grant funding. With that grant funding, there always is something that you have to be able to put in, and that is in-kind support through your town or through your other partner agency. So the town has actually contributed about 817,000 in in-kind resources. That's um, providing a space and a place for us. That, that's all of our financial support that's provided through the town accountant, as well as all of the support the town manager provides. And then being part of the coalition, there's a cost to that, and it requires a lot of support of many different departments and entities. Um, we also um, are currently funded under the last five years of a 10-year grant. So we are nearing the end of our 10 years of funding, and we're no longer eligible to apply after the 10 years. The goal is to be sustainable or to be able to manage once the grant is over, and they expect you to be well integrated into your town or, or city system by the time the 10 years have ended. So the hope is that we would become part of the town budget. That's something that you know will be up for discussion as you move through that, that budget period. But for right now, we are currently fully um, grant funded. And then funding is 125,000 a year. Um, how it works, there's myself and a point, um, point six person, um, Julianne D'Angelo, she's our part-time outreach coordinator. She's also a licensed alcohol and drug counselor, so she's got some really fabulous expertise. We work together as a team. Um, as well as working with our, our board members and partners in the schools in town. Um, I spent a lot of time doing public speaking. Um, in the last year, I've spent about half of my time doing public speaking engagements, either working in the classroom, um, speaking for groups, um, working with parents, um, hosting events. Uh, we also do a lot of data collection and analysis. Um, national data is great. State data is sometimes helpful. Local data is invaluable. It tells us what is happening. And there are many pieces of data that I think for our police officers that they don't always have the time to really look at and study and that's part of my job is to look at what's happening with every substance use incident and see what are the resources going into it, how could we prevent, intervene, address in a different way and a lot of that study has turned into programming. So for example, in looking at the increase in mental health calls, we anticipated that, wrote a grant, uh, brought in mental health first aid training with our, with our public school system and we were able to train 600 people, but as part of that, we were also able to train all of our police officers. Half of their training was focused on helping them respond to public incidents involving mental health crisis. The other half of the training was focused on their own response to trauma, and that someone brought up the idea of what kind of resources are there in terms of that. It's a very stressful job, <laughs> and so a lot of the mental health training is also focused on helping them manage some of the, the stress that goes on. Um, 
basically we're town employees we're cited at the police department we're adjacent to the detectives division we work very closely with them I spend about half my time out and about in the community that's either in one of the schools or or at meetings but a lot of time um, I'm at the police department um, the social norms that we focus on trying to address we have some positive social norms that we want to continue to nurture and keep in our community these are these are norms that came out of needs assessments that we've been doing over the last 10 years um, what we've determined that there's some norms that keep and protect our community moving in a positive direction one is that there's enormous opportunity in Reading for most young people um, there's a lot to offer if they can take advantage of it um, most young people do not use substances although we see a lot of the statistics showing there's concern not every young person is using in fact the majority of young people are not using substances most young people do feel connected to our community and that's because of the work of the schools it's because of the work of the library it's because of all the different um, ad hoc groups that we have little league and all the other supportive services our recreation department and then most of our young people are pausing to think about what is the impact of their choices on their future on their current situation on the flip side the negative and kind of pervasive negative norms that we deal with is that we do have access to substances young people have access to prescription medication they have access to alcohol more and more they have access to marijuana particularly synthetic marijuana which is sold online and you can get it in head shops it's sold as um, <coughs> non edible products but you can inhale it um, we also have issues with generational am amnesia that's a little ter term that our teens are going to to kind of address the fact that once we get to adulthood we kind of forget what it was like <laughs> when you're in your teens and how challenging it is and how intense it is and how difficult it is to sometimes break away from what the group is doing and kind of make your own decisions um, we also have dealt with an enormous amount of false sense of protection we find that not just amongst our young people but amongst our adults um, living in a community that is you know considered to be safe people often don't anticipate that bad things can happen to them and substance use knows um, it can affect anyone and that's you know that's a really important thing for um, every family member every person reading to have a conversation about the issue of substances because it's not, it's something that can happen to anyone regardless of your background and then the style of use amongst the young people that are using substances they're using heavy they're using early and they're using frequently and that's where the concern comes in is uh, they're not having you know a glass of wine and talking about craft beers they're binge drinking um, they're getting to the, the the issues where we we see alcohol poisoning that the fire department has to respond to or we see issues with um, kids getting sick um, people passing out um, not calling 911 so there's other things that happen with the style of use that's concerning in terms of access one of the ways that we try to address it is with our, our medication safety program um, we are trying to reduce poisonings in the home as well as access to medication um, which can become addictive over time so if you look at when we started the program in 2009 uh, 29 bottles got dropped off and um, this year or last year we were at 6690 bottles um, it's about three times <coughs> the medication that we've collected um, since we started the program that is that is not cumulative that is per year per year yep Stunning. It's, it's a stunning amount of medication, and the medications that we get in are morphine, codeine, oxycontin, <coughs> about 75% of what, what we get in are narcotic products. And um, we've seen bottles of, of liquid bottles of morphine, fentanyl patches, everything you can imagine that could be very dangerous to a young person or a child. So we appreciate so much when people bring their stuff in. We also see things going back many, many years when people maybe get into a home and they clean out stuff or someone has passed. We've seen things from 1920, <laughs> things in glass bottles, potions, all kinds of stuff. So the oldest thing we saw was 1920. Dr. Johnson's um, elixir. In <laughs> pharmacies, you've never heard of. So it's she it's been it's interesting. Um, we also introduced dissolvable pouches for folks that maybe are homebound or can't get out to drop off their medication. These are pouches that you can um, pour the bottle of pills into. You pour a little bit of water in. You rub it together. It dissolves the product and you can no longer use it to get high in any way. So what that means is it also dissolves in a way that you can put it into your trash, whereas we don't recommend you put your pills in the trash because it's an area where people could dig through them to get the pills, and they also go into our, our water system. So if you could imagine three tons of medication that we've diverted from our water system, that's pretty impressive from an environmental standpoint, as Andy knows <laughs> um, how important that is. Um, in, an enormous amount of um, diversion of access which we're, we're very proud of 
but that program requires a full-time police officer to be, be monitoring the, the drop-off box. We have to count it on a weekly basis. We have to bring it up for disposal. It has to be witnessed by a full-time police officer. So the destruction of the actual pills, we have to watch them go into an incinerator. I have to be present. The detective has to be present. So there's a whole kind of chain of custody that happens with the drugs that's very important from a public safety perspective, as you can imagine. But very valuable program. Um, from a connection standpoint, as you saw with the mental health responses that we've seen for our, our fire uh, excuse me, our, our firefighters as well as our police officers, um, it's a huge area of concern. We've tried to introduce some opportunities for connection. It's very difficult sometimes to access mental health services if you don't know what you need or you don't know what your insurance will cover. There's also sometimes a shortage of mental health providers in your particular area of interest. So for primary care providers, there's about one in 100 for primary care providers. For mental health providers, it's one in 478. So when you're looking, the pool is smaller, and then their expertise is even more specialized. So someone might be great with someone who's you know, 12 and under with anxiety issues. Someone might be great in another area. So we partner with William James Interface Referral Service. They have um, a phone helpline where we contract with them, they answer the phone, it's either a licensed clinician answering the call or someone who's training at the doctoral level. They take your information, they find out what you're looking for, they do an intake, and what they try to do is match make with what the appropriate service might be. So they call you back in a couple days or a week with three matches. Person that will take your insurance, has open appointments, and meets the needs that you requested. Sometimes people will want a female, someone who, who is in the Spreading Stoneham area, those types of details. Since we started the program back in November, we've had um, 60 cases um, that have been able to then match with services. Um, that's from November 2016 to June. We will have more data coming in, but this is what we have for now. And when people call, they usually share what their most pressing concern is or what they're calling for. It might be my child is experiencing anxiety or I'm experiencing depression, whatever it might be, or I'm not sure, we're just having some, some struggles. So you can see from the charts, um, there's a lot of anxiety, family-related, social issues, um, substance use, and then on the bottom is a number of other issues that come up, things like cognitive impairment, things about trauma, self-injury, veterans issues, grief, um, end-of-life issues. So, you know, it really kind of runs the gamut. <coughs> For people in Reading, anyone can use a service. You don't have to be in the teen years. You can be a parent of a younger child. You can be an elderly person. It doesn't matter what your age is. Everyone in Reading is eligible. Um, and you can see from the amount of um, calls, it's been very well received. And the way that we fund this service, we have partial grant funding, and then we also um, got support from the Reading Hospital Trust Fund. Um, to help support a portion of that, and that's been extremely helpful. Um, anxiety was such a big issue, we actually hosted a special um, author and speaker in, back in November um, to come in and talk about the issue. We had 300 people come out to the schools um, to hear that, that presentation. So it's a really powerful concern, but it's information that we wouldn't know unless we were doing the service and seeing kind of what people are looking for in terms of need. Um, we also, um, num offer a number of different programs, um, Youth Mental Health First Aid, which is one of the programs I mentioned that we offer to our officers, as well as to our librarians, our school department. Um, I can't say enough about the work that we do with our school department. Um, I meet with John um, Doherty, our, our superintendent, on pretty much a weekly basis on a number of different projects. I work very closely with our athletic director, our principals um, for middle school, high school, as well as the elementary folks. We do a lot of work together. One of the biggest projects we've been working on at the high school level has been ESPER, which is screening, grief intervention, and referral to treatment. There's a state mandate that requires that you now do screening in at least two grades. Um, so we've been helping them roll that out. There's a our CASA staff person. Actually, both of us are present during screening. It takes about six to seven weeks. Um, Julianne is on hand to handle anybody that might come out of screening showing some concern. So as a licensed counselor, she can meet with them and talk with them. And then I'm also there to, to do data entry, which is required by the state. And then our, our clinical screening is done by our nurse. Um, that project um, right now is in its first regular year. We did a pilot last year. And so, so far we've, we've screened 600 young people. We also operate a juvenile diversion program with our Reading Police and our District Attorney, a chemical health education program with our high school. Since the school year started, we've had 12 referrals from the high school for the chemical health education program. Um, the majority of that is for vaping, so we're seeing most, um, most of our issues right now are with vaping of nicotine and marijuana. 
Um, we also tried to address the issue of generational amnesia with our Hidden in Plain Sight project last year at the police department. In our community room, we set up a teen bedroom donated by the Mission of Deeds, which was awesome. They brought it all in and set it up for us. And then we hid some items around the room, invited parents to come in to kind of see if they could spot what the issues might be um, to spot if your child might be using. And that was really well received. We had 130 people walk through. The YMCA helped co-sponsor it. They brought in a lot of parents of um, younger children, which was really great. Um, we got to do a lot of education, not just around the substances, but smartphone safety, um, you know, parenting strategies, all kinds of different things um, came up. And also brought people into the police station for, a, you know, more of a proactive uh, concern rather than coming in for something that's upsetting. <laughs> Did you happen to videotape that so that it has a life? It's not videotaped, but on our website, the full exhibit is there. You can click through the bedroom. So if you go to the Our Castle website, which is a link off of the Reading Public Schools website, you can go through the whole bedroom. And what was the average parental grade? Um, it was really a good cross-section. Sorry, was, how did they do? What was, how did oh, they, uh, um, no one got all of them. I would say about they got about half. There were 20 see. items hidden. Um, people would find it, but they didn't know what it meant. So there was that, you know, a lot of people could find that like, this like for one here. example, there is a deodorant that has a hide in it. Um, so it looks just like a regular speed stick yeah, and see. the bottom comes out. So they, you know, it just looks like deodorant. So unless you knew to kind of play with it, you wouldn't I know. See. Um, so there's some items that are tricky and then some that are not as obvious, like uh, a pen cap um, or a, a pencil that um, the, the eraser is pulled out. Sometimes that's used for self-injury. So there's some things that you wouldn't know unless you have an opportunity to talk with yep. someone who's familiar with teen behaviors. So we had a lot of good conversation around what does the object mean, why might you find it, what do they use it for. Mm. But that's all on the website. You that's all on the website, yep. Yeah. On the topic of the website, um, do we still have the link? Yes, for so uh, if you go to the town <coughs> website, if there we have a page and, and the link to the larger website is there. And you know where I'm going. Yep. Uh, you, you know, because I, I feel so strongly about the most recent guests that we had in town. Um, is that a continuous loop, YouTube? Yes, so would we have it, a Do you think it would make some sense maybe to split the two of them? So, you know, I know people are busy, 20 minutes here, yep. 20 minutes there. Um, we have the YouTube video of Dr. P Dr. Ruth Pody, who was a family medicine physician and addiction specialist, come back in September for our annual meeting. And we were able to videotape that with the help of RCTV. Um, and there's two major presentations, one from District Attorney Mary and Ryan and one from Dr. Pody. And we've noted um, on the, on the um, website where their presentation where starts. starts. So yeah. if you want to kind of juggle to 26.5, it tells you where they are. Um, because I did talk to RCTV about that. They said they would be happy to separate them to make them more user friendly. It's something we're thinking about if you'd like. They're prepared to help us with that. Right. Um, so th th those messages both were so powerful mm -hmm. um, and they weren't redundant in any way. Yeah, they both came a out message, from, a but, I mean, from you different know. perspectives, yeah. Right. If you haven't seen Dr. Pody talk, um, there's also, for anyone that has children at the high school who are participating in activity, whether it's drama or a sport, um, there's a Dr. Pody link through when you sign your participation form. And that presentation is also very important, very powerful. If people haven't had a chance to click on it, please click on it. It's worth your while. <coughs> Um, some of the um, issues around style of use, obviously one of the biggest changes we've seen in opioid use has been the introduction of uh, synthetic fentanyl. So fen fentanyl that's being illegally produced, um, not pharmaceutical grade, but very powerful. Um, we see some of it coming out from different countries. Um, we also have seen fentanyl in the form of, it looks like a Perc 30 pill, a Percocet 30, um, all kinds of different variations. But what fentanyl means is it's very powerful. So 80 to 100 times more powerful than what you would find in a and an oxy and that has increased with the level of overdoses and with the level of our EMS responding because they may need to deliver more than one dose of Narcan um, to bring a person back and sometimes you can't get a person back when they stop breathing so it's it's serious stuff it's something that um, we have to take seriously and things are always changing so that's why having a drug detective assigned to the FBI is so critical it's why having a night detective is so critical having a school resource officer on the ground having an additional school resource officer um, I probably spend about um, with our school resource, about 30% of our time is spent together. <laughs> we do a lot of work together, and um, 
so much of that is communication, talking, sharing information, helping with cases, doing education in the classroom. Having an additional person would be really, really powerful for the middle school and the elementary level. Um, you guys were great in helping us proclaim Recovery Month by having um, us do the proclamation for the town back in September. We had six events that month. One of them was um, a candlelight vigil, which we held at the high school. It was the first time we did a candlelight vigil in Reading for, for opioid overdoses. We had about 75 people come. It was a really beautiful night. Um, had family members who've lost people who, who live in Reading, and they were very thankful to have the opportunity to to share their stories, but also to just have the town recognize it in, in a more public way. Um, and then we also did some great work with our local churches, First Congregational and Old South, um, created blankets for babies and children who are exposed to opioid trauma. When people witness an overdose, one of the interventions that around our region, the Middlesex District Attorney has been trying to introduce is to, if a child witnesses something, to offer a blanket because it's a source of comfort and kind of help with the trauma. And um, so we collected 54 blankets during the month of September that were all handmade, really beautiful. And those will be shared with children who are exposed to opioid-involved um, trauma. We also were part of Jams for Jake, which some of you were able to attend, and thank you so much for that. Jams for Jake grew out of um, our love and, and care for a young person that we lost um, back in June. Um, he was 24 years old, really fabulous musician. Um, and his friend group came together and worked with our CASA to develop this really spectacular musical festival on a freezing cold day in November. Um, they're hoping for warmer weather next year and at a different time of year. The town was really fabulous in supporting their efforts. They put it together in a, a very brief amount of time. I think it was just a couple months lead time. Um, and our police officers were really supportive. But it was a really spectacular way to address some of the grieving that they were experiencing as friends and to turn that into something that Jake would have been really proud of, um, to, be, to have his name be part of it and his family to be part of it. The other piece of it was getting the word out to people in their peer group about Narcan, about recovery, about the resources that we have in town. Um, we had a number of people came up and thanked us for being part of it. We had grandparents who were raising their grandchildren come up and talk to us about what they're dealing with. Um, people who've been brought back by Narcan from our firefighters and how much they appreciated that because our firefighters and our police officers see people sometimes at their worst in their most vulnerable positions. And sometimes they don't get to see the person when they're well. And sometimes I get the opportunity to talk with people as they're in recovery and they're working through those things. And I can't tell you how important that the services are that they provide and also the, the importance of the seconds. So if there's a 50 second difference in the response time, that matters in terms of someone's life. And when you hear people's stories about how important it was that someone came to their aid um, I, I don't know if you can quantify that. So with that, um, my contact information is there. I'm happy to provide more details on, on our budget and kind of how we do everything. Um, but just thank you. Thank you, Erica. Okay. One, one question for you. Um, much of what you've done, you presented here, represents direct contact with the affected populations. The, the portion that we're dealing with parents, do you think we're do you think we're doing enough to educate parents for what to look for? You, you mentioned a vignette about the, the sample bedroom. That was really cool. It strikes me that that's probably something that we might be able to do more of and maybe get more eyes on the street looking for this stuff because you're dealing with the consequences of it. They may be able to deal with early symptoms of it. Is there, is there, is there stuff there that you, could, you can think about, more programmatic coverage you can think about? And might we consider augmenting this presentation with maybe that, that view of it at some later date? Sure. Uh, you know, we definitely will be offering it again. Um, we try to offer different programs that bring people into that world of kind of understanding um, what's happening. Um, I do a lot of PTO visits. I do a lot of um, small group uh, work with parents, as well as running the Mental Health First Aid program. In that program, we also talk about signs and symptoms, not just of substance use, but co-occurring issues or, or other mental health issues. One of the things that we see very often is a young person self-medicating with marijuana, alcohol, or nicotine when they're really suffering from depression or anxiety. So that's a lot of the work that I'm doing is also trying to help parents kind of tease out, okay, what might this mean and how do I get to the right service? And that's where Interface comes in and working with our partners comes in. So programmatically, we're always looking for new opportunities. Um, I will say, you know, we're a small team, <laughs> uh, me and, and, and Julie, and with the current programming we have, we, we, do, we do a lot. Um, we kind of touch about six or seven thousand 
people a year in the work that we do. Um, we always like to do more. That's partly why we partner with our regional partners. We try to offer some programs on a larger scale as a region. One example is um, our regional partners put together a great workplace summit at Tufts, and we were able to take that project and bring it to Reading in a smaller form with our local chamber of commerce. So we try to do as much as we can by kind of building off the capacity mm -hmm. um, of our regional partners. We are going to be doing a, a special parent campaign focusing on substance use with our regional partners that we're rolling out in January. Thank you. Any questions from the board, Barry? Yeah. So Erica, you said that you're on the sort of tail end of your grant. So uh, I can remember, was it 2019? So yep. basically so it's, it's this fiscal year, we're okay. <coughs> Yeah. But next fiscal year, we're on our own? Yep. Yeah. Mostly. Yeah, Mostly. it kind of crosses the town fiscal year with the grant fiscal year. So we end September 30th of 2019, yeah. and that would be three months into um, the town yeah. fiscal year. So we have to plan ahead for so that. The, so the, del the, the delta of what is not funded by the grant, how much is that, assuming the level? Um, uh, it'd be about... Yeah, a little bit less than that. Um, so have, it would be an additional 150000 that you'd have to find either from, you know, contribution from the town or other types of fundraising. Yeah. <coughs> Are there any efforts being made? I know that there was a long-term grant. Mm -hmm. I think it was from the feds, maybe, am I wrong? Or yeah. So are there, are there other grants that, um, you know, maybe not specific to running the entire organization, but maybe pieces that you've identified that um, or other types of mm -hmm. fundraising that you've thought so about. We've, we're looking at all of that and more um, I will say there's very limited limited funding for prevention people don't like to pay for something that they can't exactly see <laughs> and that's one of the challenges we you have to so pay five times the amount for the cost of, yes of I can explain it to you but yeah. but it okay. For, from a funding perspective, it can be difficult to access that money. Um, what we're seeing at the federal levels, they are rolling out some smaller grants. We will be able to apply. You have to meet a minimum level of opioid impact in your community. We actually do exceed the level, so we would be qualified, but it's a very small funding pool, so we're not sure what our chances are there. Are there chances for, like, regional? I mean, basically, I saw one of the slides that there was 150 deaths and seven, eight town Yeah, area. so the regional so project will continue to be funded for the next three years. We don't receive any direct funding, but we receive a lot of resources. Um, but it requires me to be in, as be part of that and Julianne to be right. part of it in order to get the most bang for your buck. But so the regional grants and the state grants right now, they're not funding individual coalitions. They're funding regional partnerships with a lead agency. Medford is our lead agency for that. Um, there are smaller pockets, rep, um, excuse me, Senator Lewis has put in some initiatives related to the Marijuana Cannabis Control Commission that some of the funding should be going into a prevention trust related to coalition work. Um, we're not sure how that will shake out and what it would look like and how you might apply for it. Um, there are some other funding that we have looked at also to help our officers to help with the mental health issues. Um, but any grant that you, that you go after you're expanding service, you're not maintaining service. So anything that we try to get, we have to do more than we're currently doing. So to get funding to just sustain who we are, that doesn't exist. That's the tricky bit. <laughs> Family foundations? None um, there's a little bit, there's a little bit. Um, but we're talking you know, under $5,000 for a lot of those. Yeah. Because of the small uh, part of, we're a very small community in comparison to some of the other high need areas. Any other questions from the board? Yeah, I, 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 in fact, when you said the 50 second response time can make a big difference, I, I just want to make sure that I'm connecting the dots correctly between what you, that, that comment, and um, what the chiefs are, are asking for. Um, is it safe to say that um, adding more staff to police and fire will help I don't know how to say this without being overly dramatic, but um, help reduce response time to keep it. Uh, that would be an operational question for them. I mean, I know that we have a pretty spectacular response time compared to other communities, um, but I, what I do know is, you know, there are issues with getting through town. There's issues with people moving for them to get through town. <laughs> There's all kinds of issues. So the more staff you have out on the road, you know, particularly for the officers, I think is helpful. Having two SROs, we can mitigate and avoid a lot of issues by having the SROs because they're very 
both are very proactive. The community service officer is extraordinarily proactive, and she and I are, uh, and the, op the chief are working on a project that would bring in more crisis intervention support into the department. Um, but all of that requires patrol to be sufficiently staffed in order to be able to do the other pieces. So like the chief said, having more staff allows you to do the proactive work, the prevention work. Um, and the intervention works. And on the fire side, I would leave that to the chief, you know, to address. But from our perspective, from the ability to respond to overdoses, um, I, they need it. <laughs> they need it. Okay. Um, I could have, go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry? Could I could have one last note. Yes, sure. sure. Uh, I would like to open it up to the board of select board, anyone with fan comments, anyone would like to do a ride along with the, one of our officers some, uh, some evening or some day? Feel free to get in touch with myself or the deputy, and we'll set it up in a couple hours just to see what we do. Feel free, just give us a call, and we'll gladly set it up for any of you. Okay. Thank you very much for the offer, Erica. One more question before you leave. I'm still struck by that. Maybe it's just this aha moment as a parent. You know, some of this I lived through with my own kids, and it really was this um, moment of recognizing that I what I was seeing wasn't what it was. I had to see it in its real form, and. Now looking back on it, I really wish there was a moment to explain to parents systema systematically what's going on. Have you contemplated, I know it's all tied to staffing and manpower, but is there an opportunity during parent teacher week or any of the par parental meetings in the school when you have a whole room full of parents to kind of do it in the most efficient manner? Is that, is that even an option? Um, we have talked about that. You know, it's, it's a tricky thing. There's enough anxiety and worry about the transition that's happening usually yeah. for most kids that yeah. we try not to pile on too much more to that. Yeah. Um, but we are tr we are looking at different ways that we can. We've, we've done um, coffees with parents. We've done some, some morning events. We've done evening events, weekends. We've tried to, to piggyback on any major community events. Um, but it is it is tricky. The school events in, in and of themselves are, are pretty well packed with a lot of material. Um, we do get invited into orientations and different things like that um, to show that there's resources for young people and for parents. Um, we also offer an online parenting program called Active Parenting, and we've taught that program as well. So there's a lot of opportunities, but with any opportunity, it requires some time on the parents' part, and what we found is people are so stretched and so busy that yeah. it is difficult for them to get that time. That's why we encourage people to visit the website. There's a lot of resources there that you can view at your leisure. Um, give us a call. Julianne is really great at troubleshooting issues in terms of if you tried X, it hasn't worked, let's try Y. There's all kinds of different ways that we can support um, families in the community. Wouldn't but you, I, I appreciate the feedback. And we'll, we'll wouldn't you that. agree that, that you know, Time is one of them, denial's another. Denial's a huge piece, yeah. you know, and readiness to address the issue. So it's not just denial, but it's also coming to that, you know, it's like you gotta be ready to pull the trigger. You know, yeah. you gotta be ready not just to move forward with services, but you gotta be ready to move forward with boundaries. You gotta be ready to move forward with yeah. what you're gonna withhold. And that is very difficult for all of us because we emotionally are so connected to our, our children. Um, and even parents of adult children, they struggle with it. Um, it's, it's very difficult. The behavior of someone who is in the active disease of addiction can be atrocious. It can have enormous impact on their loved ones. But they're a person who's suffering from a disease. And so it's very difficult sometimes for the family inside what's happening with the disease to take a step back and figure out what do I do. And so it does require a lot of support and willingness to kind of cut through some of that denial and kind of develop a little bit of that you know, readiness to really move forward. Um, and we have people who call, you know, 10, 12 times before they're ready to go to a meeting, before they're ready to, um, you know, bring in an interventionist or, you know, different strategies that might work or, you know, a lot of people benefit from 12-step, which is free and available in our community and around the country. Recovery works. The, the relapse rate for substance abuse recovery is the same for diabetes and heart disease. So it does work, but it does require people to accept that there is something going on. And that's, that's the tricky, tricky bit. <laughs> It's a Any questions for the audience? <coughs> yes. <coughs> Why not pull it? Um, Celine Webb, Precinct 1, again, and Vice President for CASA. So I just really wanted to say that the, I've been involved in CASA since the bylaws were first formed, and then I've been on the board, I think, for at least the last 10 years. And I think one of the difference that I, differences that I, I hope I'm actually seeing right now is that maybe five years ago, what would happen is there would be an incident in the community 
and and people would get extremely upset and say, you know, what is Rikasa doing? You know, they aren't doing anything. Why did this happen? And I think that we are seeing in the last maybe just two years or so, um, getting some traction about how the proactive measures um, and and all the different ways that Erica just talked about that she is out in the community and working with the schools and out with the parents. But I think the biggest thing is we, it was on the survey it was uh, how do people get their information you know from their neighbors from talking to each other um, and maybe you know some of those, the social media pages but they basically said from my neighbors and I think what's critical is that all of us you know are, are able and quick to say well CASA has that resource go to the website go to Erica go to this department call Julianne these are resources that are here and I think we're finally getting a little bit beyond that inertia um, in terms of people recognizing the resources are there, but it's con it's continual. So I think the issue the issue we see is as we look down the road in the two years and three years, we have to make a decision as a community how are we going to continue to want this resource? And so if our community is talking about an override and this budget gap is going to be within the period of that uh, potential override, I think that's where it's important to be, you know, understanding what that financial need is going to be and how would we plan to factor that in. Uh, so I just want to highlight that point. It's such a clearly valuable and indispensable resource and I'd like thank Erica and Julianne for all that they do because they're pretty incredible. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Yes. I just wanted to say also that you gave a presentation at Parent University, and so that's, I think, a really good forum for getting um, to reach the family community you were speaking of, John, um, and when there's a lot going on that day, so I think that that was a great draw for parents because they could go to a bunch of different things, and that can be a, a very um, community-oriented program as well, not only for parents and kids in school. So. I hope everybody will come next time. So I didn't want you to sell yourself short. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank everybody. That brings this evening to an end. Before we break, I, I want to repeat the comments I made at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, the Board of Selectmen <coughs> survey that was taken in August and the first week of September contained approximately 1,700 comments. Many of those comments spoke to the need for greater clarity, greater consistency, greater awareness on the part of the public as it related to the expenditures of funds in the town and the resources in the town. This meeting, the meeting that preceded it, and those that will come after it are all aimed at providing that level of granularity with the context for you to understand. I realize we're talking to a relatively small number of people here tonight, but for those watching on RCTV, this is one of the opportunities we've tried to make available to the public. Uh, whether you're here tonight or whether you see it on rebroadcast, looking at a sh spreadsheet of numbers is nowhere near as helpful as listening to the subject matter experts themselves speak to their craft, speak to the opportunities, speak to the problems, and most of all, speak to the gaps. You have an opportunity to ask questions, and you always have an opportunity to disagree or agree. Um, I'd urge you to get engaged at our next meeting, which is September 18th. December. Uh, sorry, December 18th. That's My goodness. Yeah, 19th. Thank yeah, we you. We won't be doing any budget on the 18th. Thank you. Um, but again, this is our attempt to respond directly to the complaint, largely, that there was insufficient or inadequate communication. So I, ho I hope in some way that's that's been achieved this evening. With that, if there's no other comments on the board, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. second. Barry will second. All those in favor? 5-0. We are out. Thank you very much, and have a good evening.